Roll at 10 and 5, yes, thank you. Thank you. Captain Tonical, if I can confirm the live stream is up and running now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Philippa. Thank you. Okay, it's 10.05. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, licensing subcommittee. Um, I would suggest that probably the best thing to do in the first place is for everybody to introduce themselves so that we all know who we are. Um, I'll start with myself. I'm Councillor Pauline Tunnicliffe and I'm chairing the meeting this morning. Um, my colleagues today are Councillor Bob Evans and Councillor Vanessa Allen. I don't know which way round you want to go, um, whether you want to do it by screens. I don't know if everybody has um, got the same picture as I have, but if somebody would just like to start with an introduction, that would be great. And Philippa, if you could then make sure everybody has confirmed who they are and why they're here. Thank you. So who would like to kick off? Gloria, my solicitor. Yes. Hi, Gloria. Why a solicitor? Thank you. Uh, Steve Wood from Democratic Services, just providing some admin support. Uh, good morning, Steve. Um, I will introduce myself, seeing as I'm up in the top corner. Um, my name is Noreen Meehan. I'm director of the Great Northwood Collective, which is an arts charity based in Crystal Palace, and we are the producers of the Crystal Palace Festival. Good morning, Noreen. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. And I'll go next then. I'm Graham Whitlock and I am the chair of the Great Northwood Collective, which organises Crystal Palace Festival. Good morning. Good morning, Graham. Um, chair, I'm um, Philip Colvin and I'm the co-chair of the Crystal Palace Park Trust. No, I can't see you. Sorry, could you just say your name again, please? Philip Colvin. I'm down as What's PK your... on your screen. That's, right. That's what confused me. PK. Do I help <laughs> PK? And again, you're the chairman of the trust. I'm the co-chair of the trust co with Martin Tempier. Yeah. OK, lovely. Thank you. I'm Emily Jewell. I'm a hub director uh, for the Upper Norwood Library Hub. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Patricia Brandmore for the Dulwich Society. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning. Hello, I'm Chrissy Kinsella. I'm Chief Executive of the Mayor of London's Music Education Charity, and I'm here to support uh, Crystal Palace Park Trust. Good morning, Chrissy. Is that everybody? In the uh, boardroom, I'm Simon Taylor, and I'm good, representing the applicant. Good morning. morning. And there's four of you there, yes? Yes, and my, my name's Melvin, Melvin Ben, uh, I'm the applicant. Oh yes, I've seen your name on the, on the papers, thank you. You're very tiny on my screen, I can't see. I can't see you clearly. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, maybe I, I'll, I'll get my team to um, zoom us in, perhaps. That, that, might, uh, that might help. It, it might be helpful, yes, because it, there's quite a lot of people here this morning, so that would be helpful. And your two colleagues are... Hello. My name is John Pragin from Personal Republic. OK, thank you. And finally... Hello, yes, um, Jim Griffiths, so Vanguard here. I'm the acoustic consultant. OK, good morning. And I think that leaves Claire. Hello, Claire. Hi, Pauline. Um, I'm Claire Armstrong. I work with Melvin and the Festival Republic team. Thank you. Um, and Steve Phillips. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, Stephen Phillips. I am the head of health, safety and licensing for the London Borough of Bromley. 
Okay, and I can also see Councillor Angela Wilkins. So welcome to you, Councillor Wilkins. Uh, I've missed somebody up in the top corner, Mr Patel. Yeah. Yeah, hello, my name is Chirash Patel. I'm a resident of Crystal Palace Park Road. Okay, good morning to you, Mr. Patel. Philippa, is that everybody? Oh, Jerry Gillsby, I've got in the corner as well. No, do we know who Jerry Gillsby is, please? Claire? Yeah, Claire. Hi, hi, Pauline. Jerry um, is our traffic consultant. Okay, that's lovely. Is that everybody? I I think there's a few more people just trying to join at the moment from the trust. I've just seen some emails. People are just trying to join. So you might want to keep an eye out for them joining. Does anybody have any objections to just hanging on another couple of minutes to give other people the chance to join? I'm quite happy just to have a pause, having introduced so many, had so many introductions. Let's just give it a minute or two to see if everybody else can, can join. And then we'll start. I'll give it till 12 minutes past. It's 10.10 10 on my computer at the minute. Thank you. Technology. I've got a printer not working now, but never mind. Councillor Tunnicliffe, uh, would you mind if I uh, just step in at this point? Um, I, I, I heard someone saying that members... Oh, Steve, yes, yes, hi. Yes, sorry. I heard that members of the Trust are trying to log in. Can I ask in what capacity they are logging in? Because I only was aware of Mr Colvin as a supporter who has put a representation. It's, this isn't an open meeting. Are these your witnesses, Mr Colvin? Mr Colvin? There were, ah, there were two blocks of people. There were just various trustees who I can see trying to log in now. They're not witnesses. Um, but you'll know, councillors, that last Monday we put in a clip of papers including myself and the names of a few witnesses um, who I would like to speak. And I've been in correspondence with, with uh, Mr. Phillips and your lawyer about about their, about their my, my right to call witnesses to speak on our behalf. But they're all going to be very short. They're just going to be a couple of minutes each just to provide a few words of support to our position. OK, thank you very much. I just didn't recognise the names. Uh, and obviously we, they have to be party to the hearing to be able to address the committee. Yeah, absolutely. And in that case, then, I'm assuming, Steve, that we can't begin until we can clarify who these people are. On Actually, on the screen. Steve, you're on mute. Sorry, I keep pressing my button there. I do apologise. Um, well, these are Mr Colvin's witnesses under the trust as a supporter. Um, I don't see any reason to delay the hearing because they are only offering their words of support to the application through Mr Colvin. And um, obviously there are a number of objectors as well that have live streamed in. So obviously it's your call, but I'm, I'm not so sure that we need to delay uh, this uh, meeting beginning. OK, thank you for that, Steve. It is getting on for 10.15, so I tend to agree it could tentatively be a, a long hearing, so I think we should um, make a start, actually. So I've introduced my colleagues on the panel, and everybody has introduced themselves sort of who is party to this hearing. Um, my next uh, question is to the applicant and the objection uh, objectors to check that you've received all the relevant information from the council to do with this hearing. And I would address that to you, PK, I believe. Um, I've certainly seen the uh, council agenda papers, which are 142 pages long. So that, that's the material I've seen. OK, and could you just give me your full name again? I don't feel quite comfortable. I'm so sorry, Councillor. <laughs> so if, I, 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 if I had the technological ability, I will change my name and I might just give that a go. But my, my full name is Philip Colvin, K-O-L. V I N That's Q amazing. Q C. Um, you should have from us a bundle of papers which is 19 pages long. 
Um, and the first document in that bundle is my witness statement um, from which you'll get my full name and background and so forth. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and everybody who is connected to this hearing is now able to access the meeting as far as I'm aware. So it's really over to the applicant to present your case in the first instance, please. If you'd like to go ahead, thank you. Good morning. Can everybody hear me clearly? Loud and clear, thank you. And could I just request that everybody else, I think everybody is on mute because it does significantly help with any interference while other people are speaking, thank you. Um, first of all, my name, just to clarify, my name is Simon Taylor and I'm the legal representative for the applicant. Uh, what I, how I intend to approach this is to uh, make a presentation uh, which will be reasonably lengthy uh, because it is obviously a complex uh, matter. Um, and um, I have with me uh, Mr. Ben, um, Mr. Probin and Mr. Griffiths, who in due course will be very happy to answer specific questions that may arise. Um, I'd like to start by telling you um, about the applicant. Live Nation is the world's leading live entertainment company. Worldwide, pre-pandemic, it organized and promoted some 40,000 shows, over 100 festivals, and operates in 40 different countries. Live Nation Music UK is the UK parent company, and it is uh, the parent of Festival Republic. In 2015, there was a rationalization of businesses with Festival Republic overseeing all live events. Uh, Festival Republic's reputation has been built over many years. It specializes in the successful delivery of music festivals and other types of outdoor events. For example, in 2018, Festival Republic delivered 28 major outdoor events in the UK, Ireland, Spain, and Germany. Mr. Ben, who is mentioned on numerous occasions in the papers, is the managing director of Festival Republic and will have personally, personal responsibility for the events at Crystal Palace, should this license be granted. He has some 40 years experience of successfully organizing events. And I'd like to mention briefly some of the events which, it, which illustrate his success Glastonbury Festival, he organised between 2012, sorry, between 2002 and 2012. Um, it's fair to say that he turned around that particular festival and its capacity uh, when he left was for 177,500 festival goers. Reading Festival, he has operated Reading Festival since 1989. Um, that takes place in the footprint of Reading Town, and there are some 80,000 festival goers. Leeds Festival, he created in 1999 at Bramham Park, which is a stately home, a capacity of 80,000. Penham in 2006, another stately home, uh, 50,000. He has annual events which take place in London parks at Hyde Park, Clapham Common, Finsbury Park, Gunnersbury Park, um, and Black Heath. Um, he has a tremendous reputation uh, within the industry. And what is, I could call a core value, is that he creates events that are successful year on year. Key to that is the partnership that he forms with councils, responsible authorities, the local community and business. That is at the core of his success. Within Live Nation and Festival Republic, um, a team of experienced staff has been built up which have worked with him for many years. Also in Live Nation and Festival Republic, they have teams of contractors who are tried and tested and use and provide special services at their events. For example, in noise management, security, medical provision, welfare, litter and waste collection. 
He also looks for constant improvement, which begins following a debrief for an event and through planning. Within the industry, he, Live Nation and Festival Republic, have over the years sponsored barrier research um, at the front of stage, improvement to music systems, the vision of the Purple Guide, um, an annual conference uh, with the police and industry, and he sits on various advisory groups, including counter-terrorism. They are an incredibly uh, successful organization, but that success is built on delivering uh, successful events. And that's what he will bring to Crystal Palace uh, if he's successful with this application. I'd now like to move on to some key points um, in the application. First of all, consultation and planning. The Section 182 guidance recognises that local authorities, responsible authorities and local residents have local knowledge, which is invaluable. Therefore, the applicant has already reached out to the responsible authorities, local councillors, local organisations and business. Engagement has taken place with contact to 15 local councillors from the local boroughs. There have been two residence meetings um, which have taken place so far. There have been meetings with, or, or sorry, we've reached out to 11 local societies, 13 local organisations and two business organisations. In terms of the authorities, we've had meetings with licensing, environmental health, child protection, highways. Particularly in the past few months, we're working with transport providers, Transport for London, Network Rail, Govia Thameslink, Arriva Rail, London Buses, and Uber Taxis. We've contacted the police, both their planning and licensing functions. And we have also um, spoken with Bromley Council about including the other local boroughs within the planning process. We've also spoken with regard to engaging with the multi-agency forum known as the SAG Forum. Um, and it's been agreed that those meetings can take place only um, after the license hearing has started. The consultation is by no means finished. Um, we've also committed in the papers to appoint a community response manager. There will be an email address set up in January. We've committed to hold residence meetings um, so that we're, we have further meetings arranged, probably three as from uh, January 2021. During the event, there will be a hotline for information and the receipt of complaints. We will also have a letter drop before the event, um, which will give um, the methodology for communicating with us, whether by phone or by website. So there is in place already and has been consultation and planning. Now, with regard to the planning, um, I, I'd like to take you, please, to see the structure for the planning uh, for events, should this application be successful. Um, could I ask, please, that you have um, a copy of the draft conditions that were submitted as part of the application? They should be within the supplementary papers um, that have been supplied um, in the last week or so. Um, do you have a copy of those conditions to hand, please? No, I don't. This is Chiraj Patel speaking. I don't have any documents supplied to me. Right. Sorry. Um, could uh, I, could, can could I... This in, in, can I... Sorry, can I just ask Councillor Evans, have you had sight of those, and Councillor Allen? Yes, thank you, we have, thank you. Right, 
Well, if, if I may, I will take you to those conditions uh, because this pro th these conditions provide the structure for the planning. Um, it is a formal structure which is enshrined in these conditions. Um, if we could start um, at the conditions and paragraph or, or condition three, there is an obligation on us uh, to provide notice of events um, with six months notice. There is then a condition four, a requirement to liaise with the multi-agency forum known as SAG. Um, I, I could also add that at paragraph 11... Uh, Miss, sorry, Mr. T Mr. Taylor. Narrative. Mr. Taylor. Yes. I'm sorry, Councillor, you're on mute, I think, at the moment. I'm so sorry. Um, could you just go back a couple of minutes, just a couple of paragraphs? I missed some of what you said there. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, starting with the conditions, um, please, could we look at condition three uh, to start with? And you will see there that there is the notice that has to be given six, six months prior to the first day of the events. This is notice to the licensing authority and the police. The next stage is liaison with the multi-agency forum known as SAG, which is at paragraph four, condition four. And then you will see at number five, there is reference to a draft event management plan, which has to be submitted to the multi-agency forum at least five months prior to the first event day. So that is how the effect, effectively that is how the planning and organization of the event begins with those. And you will see in the event management plan, there are 21 appendices plus other policies which cover all aspects of the management, the proper management and organization of an event or, or of events such as this. So that, that is how the planning process uh, begins. There is scrutiny um, through the multi-agency forum of those plans. And so we get to paragraph seven, condition seven, which explains that the final draft of the event management plan after scrutiny by the multi-agency forum, must be approved 28 days before the first event day. Any changes after that must be approved by the licensing authority. And you will see in paragraph eight, condition eight, that should it be necessary during an event for any amendment to the event management plan, this can be done by the event liaison teams which comprises the premises license holder, security, and the multi-agency forum. The multi-agency forum will include, of course, the licensing authority and the responsible authorities. So there is a very, very robust uh, planning system which is in place, which is enshrined in the conditions. And then condition nine, the premises license holder agrees that it will implement the final event management plan. That is a structure um, which Live Nation and Festival Republic use at their events um, literally throughout the world, but particularly um, within this country. And it works. And so they are able to deliver successfully and to the satisfaction of the responsible authorities. Um, you will also see, because this is a multi-year license, that there is provision for a multi-agency debrief to be held after um, the events each year. And the purpose of this is to learn from those events and make improvements um, in the following year. What I would say about this planning process 
um, is that the responsible authorities have read these conditions, have seen these conditions, they are aware of this process and they make no objection to this process. They believe it to be a robust process which will properly deliver um, the event. Um, I will, I'll move on now. Oh, I should, I should also answer one what if question. And that is, what if the plans are not approved? Um, the answer to that is simple. That if the event management plan and the plans within it are not approved, then the event will not take place. And, and that is the ultimate sanction. That if these plans are not right, if they do not address the licensing objectives sufficiently, the event will not be permitted uh, to go ahead. Um, if I can move on now and turn to the response of the responsible authorities. At page three of the committee report, um, you will see a table where the responsible authorities have been notified of the application and their views have been sought. Um, first of all, can I turn to the Metropolitan Police? The Metropolitan Police have not made any objection to this application. Um, I should add to that that the applicant has spoken to both the planning officer and the licensing officer and they, are, they have indicated that they are satisfied with the application and issues which fall under their remit can be addressed through the planning process. If we just go back to the conditions um, for a minute, please can I take you to condition 13 of the conditions? Um, may I just ask um, whether or not um, you are keeping up with me flitting from one document to another? I'm absolutely fine and understanding everything. Thank you very much. Councillor Evans and Councillor Allen, all fine. Thank you very much. Do continue. Thank you. If you don't mind, I will stop from time to time because obviously it's, it's very difficult uh, talking to, on occasion, to blank screen. Um, right. So... Condition 13, under the, under the licensing objective of prevention of crime and disorder, you, you will see there, or there begins there, a raft of conditions. Um, and I would just like to point to the areas that those conditions cover, please. Um, first of all, um, we agree we are committed to liaising with the Metropolitan Police and arranging regular meetings with them to ensure cooperation through all stages of the planning during the event itself and post event. That's conditions 13 and 14. We also make provision for the police to attend the event uh, should they regard it as being um, necessary uh, to do so. We also have um, conditions which deal with reporting of incidents and crime and the handing over of, um, of miscreants. That's all within in paragraphs 13 to 16. At paragraph, seven, at paragraph 17, condition 17 onwards, um, we go into detail about the security and stewarding that is going to take place. There is an enormous security and stewarding operation um, for the event. And you will see at paragraph 17 that we are obliged to prepare a security plan. Um, and that plan has to be approved by the Metropolitan Police Service and, of course, through the process that I described at the beginning, um, through the what is called the SAG process. So the security and stewarding 
there will be a security and stewarding schedule. Um, the schedule will have not only permanent stewarding positions, but it will also have other types of security provision, um, such as roaming security, such as covert security. Um, and you'll see that the security and stewarding placement schedule and the deployments must, at paragraph 23, be agreed and form part of the plan at least 28 days before the event commences. The draft schedule has to be submitted three months in advance of the event. In, in other words, there is going to be a very robust security provision um, throughout the events. We move on now to some specific uh, policies. At paragraph 27, we have a drugs policy. Again, it needs to be approved by the police. CCTV arrangements are at paragraphs 28 and 29. Um, they will monitor the arena entrances and the actual CCTV plan will be agreed um, with the police. There is a very robust searching policy which is included in the conditions. This appears at paragraph 30, 30 and continues as far as paragraph 34. The searching um, is in conjunction with the police and the police have to approve uh, the plan. You'll also see that counter-terrorism is also mentioned at paragraph 35, and there will be a plan as part of the event management plan. So, what we have done is we have enshrined um, within all of those conditions, issues with, um, with which the police are concerned. There are others as well, which appear elsewhere in these conditions. And if I can just briefly mention these to you, in, in addition to off to on-site security, we have a very significant off-site security plan as well, which is contained in the egress or the access and egress plan. The conditions relating to that begin at paragraph 125. And there you will see there is a commitment for security and stewards to monitor the activity of persons leaving the premises. In addition, security and stewards will be positioned along the egress routes where reasonable to safeguard residents and ticket holders. All of these details will be in the egress and ingress, ingress and egress plan, which will go through the scrutiny of the SAG. In addition to that, um, at paragraphs 99 to 107, there are details of how we will manage bars and the sale of alcohol. Again, there has to be a robust plan which has to go through the SAG scrutiny process. The final area where the police are involved is in the traffic and transport arrangements. The conditions relating to that are at paragraphs 116 and 117. And you will see that the traffic and transport plan has to be drawn up and again go through the scrutiny of the multi agency forum. And you will also note that that isn't a one-off exercise, there's specific provision that that plan will be reviewed annually. So, you, you, that, that I've, I've spent, I've dwelt on that for some time because it gives, it gives a feeling for the immense amount of detail that we go to. And I'm only mentioning that in, in connection at this moment with regard to the involvement that we will have with especially the police and also 
um, how so many of these areas overlap. And that is why the SAG and the multi-agency forum is absolutely crucial in the process of planning. If I could now move on to a second representation, which is the public health and nuisance team. And you will see that on the 8th of September, um, there was an objection made. That objection is at page 88 of the committee papers. And quite fairly, at that time, the uh, authority uh, said that they didn't have enough detail. What had been produced at that time was the Three Spires report, which is at page 46 to 67 of the committee report. That was an initial report that was done by Three Spires, um, and it was not a final report. In fact, it says in the body of the report, at section 3.1.1 at page 53, that it was anticipated that the report would need to be expanded on and there would be need, to, need to be meetings with the um, environmental health officers concerned. What happened after that, after we received the representation? Mr. Ben decided that he was going to appoint Mr. Griffiths of the company Vanguardia. Um, I don't wish to make Mr. Griffiths blush, but he is the leading um, acoustician in the country with specific um, experience in this industry. Um, he also has historic experience of the site. Mr. Griffiths has produced a far more comprehensive report, um, which following discussions with your public health team, um, has been accepted as being satisfactory to address the promotion of the uh, of public nuisance. Now, at this moment in time, um, my understanding is, and your licensing officer can confirm, the environmental, uh, sorry, your uh, public health and nuisance team has withdrawn its representation. I don't know if you have the letter. Um, can, can I also add at this stage that the initial noise conditions um, have been amended to take into account the changes that your team, that the council's team required. So if I can just point to you where they are in the latest set of conditions, at paragraphs 110 to 115 of the latest set of conditions that have been provided to you, these have been amended from an early edition so that the suitable amendments um, have been made. Yes, we have that information, thank you. Thank you. Right, now, I also hope that you have a copy of the Vanguardia report, um, which was also submitted in the past week, within the last week. Councillor Evans and Allen, do you have that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Do continue. If, if you will bear with me and please, if you have been through this report in, 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 in great detail and don't wish to hear from me uh, about its content, then, then of course, please stop me. But, but I would like to point to you um, to various sections of the report. Um, it is a technical report and perhaps it, it may help a little um, being a non-acoustic expert that I um, talk about it in... Uh, more common terms. If I can put it That's that absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. And we're grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where there is, there is, um, if I can put it this way kindly, there is um, a degree of, of uh, theoretical discussion in the first part of the report. Where I would like to take you is straight to 
page 14 of the report and the noise guidelines for Crystal Palace. There you will see at paragraph 321, um, levels are discussed and these levels have been agreed. First of all, there is reference to a maximum noise level of 75 dBA on the six proposed event days. And there is a comment that this limit is consistent with the majority of parks in urban areas. It, it then refers in the next paragraph um, and, and again justifies um, the choice of 75 dBA as being appropriate. A paragraph 3.23, there is reference to the curfew. Um, in the code of practice, which Mr. Griffiths refers to, there is a curfew time of 2300 hours. This applicant in its application asks for a terminal hour of 2230 hours. And Mr. Griffiths points out that this enables the crowd egress to be managed without any undue disturbance past 11 o'clock um, at night. In paragraph 3.24, um, Mr. Griffiths refers to low frequency bass noise. He recognizes that there is a potential for disturbance um, with bass and therefore recommends that there will be a specific low frequency level of 90 dB. All, all of these levels have been through your public health and nuisance team and have been agreed as being satisfactory. Now, there is obviously justification um, for that. And if we go to section four, which is on page 15, you will see that noise predictions have been made by Vanguardia. And particularly, I'd like to take you to page 16 and figure one, which is at the top of that page. You will see there that um, a system is used so that there is a prediction of what noise levels will be at certain, in certain areas. At the right hand side of that figure, you will see references to MP1, Annerley Hill, and two other particular points. Those are proposed noise monitoring points. And what has been done is they have been stationed around. They are meant to be what is called sensitive noise locations. So they're chosen as being representative um, of the area, for example, because of um, uh, private residences uh, being in that location. And these are agreed um, or to be agreed with the council's offices in the final uh, plan. So, so these predictions are made and on the right hand side, you will see the predictions are very positive because for both the DBA, which is the high frequencies and DBC, the lower frequencies, you will see that the predictions are that we will be within, and on occasions, well within, the proposed maximum noise levels. Uh, so colloquially, I can say that the predictions give a thumbs up um, to the maximum noise levels and the ability to control uh, the noise levels and keep them uh, within limits. If I can now take you to page 17 and the heading 
uh, noise impact. Um, again, basically, uh, Mr. Griffiths there is confirming um, that based on the predicted levels and the uh, noise level uh, fixed um, in the noise management plan of 75 and 90, or the two levels, um, he is confident that there will be no breach of the conditions. He also points out, of course, that um, different forms of music, which may take place, also have different levels. And, and it's fairly obvious that uh, modern music uh, may have higher levels than, say, classical music. Um, and he also makes a, a, a very uh, a very important point, which isn't appreciated, um, that even for modern music events, um, the support acts are restricted to lower levels um, because the headline acts um, require that they have the most impact um, for their audience. Um, so it isn't as if there is a max, the maximum noise level um, will not be sought um, all day long. That, that just would not be, uh, be practical. So, so that, that is the position with regard to the levels and how we anticipate that we can uh, keep within the levels. Um, if we go to page 18, there is the overview of the sound management um, itself. Now, first of all, there are, there, before any events start, there is a pre-meeting with the council. There is liaison with the sound system company so that off-site sound is minimized, um, both the type of sound system and the system setup. And I'm looking now at the paragraphs 5.4, 5.5, 5.12, during the event, there will be daily meetings um, with the council's team at the start of each day, and there will be a review on the second and third days um, of what has happened the day before, so that any learnings can take, uh, take place during events. There will also be meetings during the events to monitor how um, noise management is going. Could I take you now to page 20? And here we have um, an explanation of sound control um, within the venue. Paragraph 5.15 is particularly important because it tells us that whilst the noise limit is set at 15 minute intervals, so there are averages over 15 minutes, it tells us that the acoustic consultants actually have information on a one minute basis. And the importance of that is that being trained acousticians, they can see trends. So if they can on a one minute basis watch and see noise levels increasing. That enables them to inform sound engineers of the trend and require adjustments. So there is literally um, a, a minute by minute examination of the noise trends and action can be taken. The other very important point is that it is my client's noise experts who are in control. They have absolute authority to tell the sound engineers to turn the sound down if they perceive there is going to be a, um, an exceedance of noise levels. Uh, and that, that control is absolutely critical um, to what our, our noise experts do. Um, I, won't, I won't take you to the um, particularly to the page, but um, at page 28, there is an attendance schedule, and you will see there that 
uh, Mr. Venn has committed to there being seven Vanguardia operatives working on site. That's at page 28 of the report. There are seven operatives working on site. Um, Mr. Jeff Griffiths is a project manager. There's, there will be manage, management of the two stages. And then you will see there is a team of four who will be managing off-site noise. So it's not a matter of sitting on site. It, it, there is a team of four who will be managing um, what is actually happening off-site. And one of those roles is, for example, to um, respond to any complaints of noise. Um, finally, on, on noise, what I would say to you is, um, at the end of the day, there is a review of our performance, um, and that's referred to at paragraph 5.28. The noise management plan and, um, is referred to in the key conditions at paragraphs 110 to 114 of the proposed conditions. Um, and you will see, most importantly there, there is an obligation to pr produce the approved noise management plan each year uh, with a view to, to making improvements. Uh, each year. Just please, I, I realise you may in due course have questions and, and as I say, Mr Griffiths is here and I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about the, uh, the theory um, behind this as well, um, if you need to be assured on that. But moving on to the other, um, and, and I'm, I'm flitting back now to page three of the report, the other responsible authorities what I can say to you is that there are no other um, objections, um, comments from any of the other authorities. Now, what I'd like to do now is to move on to uh, the representations that have been made um, by uh, residents. Um, the way that I propose to look at those is not by choosing to go through every page and discussing what is said. What I have done is I have um, made certain headings about certain particular uh, comments and concerns that have been expressed. Um, we have also held um, a residence uh, consultation meeting um, as well. And so that there have been learnings and those have been very, very helpful. Um, first of all, um, could I just mention capacity? The capacity applied for um, is for 49,999 persons. Um, that, is, that is within the application. Um, at condition 37, in the proposed conditions, you will see that the maximum capacity includes ticket holders, guests, artists, staff, and contractors. In the papers, you will have seen reference to port a number 45,000. Forty-five thousand is the audience level, the ticket holders um, that we are committing to. So, so that explains why there are the two figures um, within the papers. They are not inconsistent. Uh, one is a total capacity, and the other is the um, target audience size. Uh, Councillor, the screen has changed. Can I check you're still with me? I'm still here. Right. Only still here. 
Yep. I'll let me uh, let me press on. Um, continuing with the capacity. Um, this is this is a safe capacity for the area of the site. Um, a risk assessment is carried out, and the site is of a sufficient size to uh, comfortably um, take that capacity. We also look at access and egress. And again, the access and egress that we put together, uh, those, the number of gates, etc., cetera, um, that is all dealt with. We also look at emergency evacuation as well. Um, again, um, that is satisfactory. And of course, um, we look at um, transport um, as well, and that is satisfactory. Um, what is telling about the capacity is that none of the responsible authorities um, regard this as an issue um, and therefore do not make objections. If I could move on, there is, there is naturally um, some concern about crime and disorder. Um, I've been through this earlier and I don't intend to repeat everything that I've said. Um, we're, we're taking a large number of measures to ensure that this objective is addressed, both on-site and off-site. These plans are going to be scrutinised and approved by the police and other members of the multi-agency group. Excuse me, I'm sorry and to interrupt, but uh, we appear to have lost Councillor Tannercliffe. Um, her connection's just gone, so uh, Mrs Gibbs, are you able to... Um... About that. Hello, Councillor Allen. Yeah, we're reliant on Councillor Tony Cliff re-establishing her connection. She has only just dropped out, so hopefully she'll um she'll log straight in. But I'll drop an email now as well just to check she's okay. Uh, so, Mr. Taylor, would you mind hanging on for a moment to see if we can I'll get pause, her yes. back? <laughs> Thank you. Hello, this is um, Stephen Phillips, the licensing officer. Perhaps I could suggest, as we've been going for nearly an hour now, we just simply take a five-minute comfort break, um, which will give Councillor Tunnicliffe a chance to come back in. Um, it, it will give our applicant's voice a chance to have a glass of water and uh, maybe come back in five minutes. How does that sound? Thank you very much, Mr Phillips. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody.
Okay, hello, can you hear me? Hello, Councillor Tunnicliffe, yes, we can hear you. Hi. I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened. I'm trying to go back in on my laptop, but this is on my iPad temporarily. Um, okay. Uh, we, we took a five minute break, comfort break, while you were sorting out the technical problem. So might okay. be worth checking everyone's back in a yeah. minute and then carrying on. Thank okay. you. My um, Daisy's internet's working fine. So it's just sometimes when it's connected to Bromley, I thought everybody's had gone. But I'm going to try and rejoin on my laptop, but I'll keep this one going as well. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, it's reconnected now. Pepper? Hello, Philippa. Hello, Councillor Tunnicliffe. Yes, I'm going to have to carry on on my iPad because I've just gone reconnecting the whole thing on my Bromley laptop and it's just not for some reason connecting. OK. I but I can manage with this just about. Okay, brilliant. OK. okay. Chairman, are you okay for the hearing to continue? Yes. Sorry, everybody. Just some problem, technical problem, my end. But I'll carry on on this little machine. I can just about manage. Okay. Very sorry about that, Mr. Taylor. Carry on, please. Mr. Taylor is still um, uh, in the gents, I'm afraid, uh, councillor. Um, uh, breaking. We'll okay. Back. We can... back very no problem. Quickly. Okay. No worries. Apologies. Hello, Thank Mr. You. Taylor. Yeah. Are you ready to continue? Uh, yes, I am. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm on I'm my small iPad. It's a, it's a little tricky, but I'll I'll do the best I can. Carry on, please. Um, I'm I'm conscious I I lost you um, at a particular moment, and I, just to recap, um, I I'd moved on. I'd done capacity, spoken about capacity, and then moved on to crime and disorder, which I'd already. Uh, spoken about earlier. Um, I, I'm now going to move on to um, antisocial behaviour, which is 
uh, referred to um, in several of the representations as being a concern, which is quite uh, understandable. Um, in fact, this, um, the way that um, we deal with antisocial behavior is an example of where we go above and beyond our legal responsibility. Um, our legal responsibility um, stops um, at a point relatively close to our side. Um, in fact, um, the measures that we take um, go far beyond that, and I'll, I'll, and I'll explain. Um, we have a specific ingress and egress plan, um, and um, that deals with um, not only the immediate uh, ingress and egress into the site. So, for example, we have CCTV, uh, which monitors those entering and leaving the site, and we have searching, um, etc. But particularly on the egress phase of the event, um, we go far beyond uh, the immediate uh, environs of the site. Uh, so, for example, um, our egress plan takes into account the routes um, to public transport hubs, um, the hubs themselves. And by that, what I mean is that these routes and hubs will be stewarded um, and manned by uh, security. Um, the numbers and deployments um, will be agreed within the multi-agency forum. Um, we anticipate that the number of personnel that we will deploy in these phases um, will be in the hundreds, um, not in single figures. Um, and as an example, um, looking at other events um, that we have um, operated, organized, um, on one occasion, we've deployed as many as 351 um, stewards and security on the egress phase uh, of an event. And in addition, have had a further 60 staff um, as a reserve who could be um, deployed. They have all sorts of duties, um, so they, they generally manage the persons leaving. Uh, we send people in the right directions to where they uh, wish to go. They manage, for example, the taxi hub, which is created. Um, they, they manage the other transport uh, hubs and um, queuing, etc. And all of this is done on a multi-agency basis so that it is agreed with the local councils. It is agreed, of course, with the police um, and the other authorities. So um, I, can, I can also say as well that um, we have response teams um, who can be deployed during events to go off site. Um, there is also an off-site during the event, obviously not as large as the egress stage, but there is um, a constant presence um, um, off-site throughout uh, the events. Um, it, it really is um, a very, very strong um, response to um, antisocial behaviour. Um, I should also mention one other element of, uh, of antisocial behaviour, that um, if, if it's unruliness, um, if it's um, fouling in the streets and all those things, all of those things are covered um, in our egress plan. And I'll speak more about that in a moment when I get on to the litter and waste. Um, so whilst we understand it is a concern, it is a concern that we appreciate and we deal with it um, within that plan. Um, I'm not going to say anything about um, noise nuisance. Obviously, that is a concern uh, which is um, made in several of the representations uh, from residents. We do have a robust plan. That plan has been uh, approved, um, and, and I'm not going to say any more at this stage. Um, moving now on to litter and waste. Um, obviously, we have a plan 
which deals with um, litter and waste um, on site. Um, the concern that's expressed by residents is uh, what about off site? Well, first of all, we, we address this on site by having lots of bins which are uh, emptied and also uh, as people leave the site, they're encouraged to put um, you know, paper or waste uh, in the bins as they're leaving. Um, however, there is obviously some litter that gets outside of the site. And what we have and what we agree uh, with local authorities is um, an off-site uh, litter collection uh, plan um, and waste plan. And basically that amounts to a program of litter collection and street cleaning in areas which are agreed within the multi-agency forum. Um, and, and we clean those areas. Again, this is an example of where we go beyond our legal obligation, um, but bluntly, we're happy to do so. So the entrances uh, to and from the park are cleaned. Um, the routes to and from the park are cleaned and the transport hubs are cleaned. Um, we also have a response team during events. So for example, if a call came in on the information and complaints line, um, a team could be sent out uh, to deal with a buildup of litter um, at a particular position. Um, also, um, you will see that we have offered to put portable toilets uh, along the egress routes um, in discussion with the community and the multi-agency. Um, bluntly, um, this is required uh, by some communities. Other communities um, don't want uh, portable toilets um, on, on the road. So that has to be dealt with sensitively. It's dealt with through consultation and it's dealt with through planning within the uh, multi-agency group. Those, whilst I have said that we're doing things beyond um, our legal obligation. Um, just to affirm those, um, can I also point out that with regard to the egress and the stewarding of the uh, routes, which I referred to earlier, we have a condition beginning at 124 reference to our egress measures. Um, and you will see that there is um, a clear condition there at 125 that we are, we are committed to have security and stewards monitoring persons that, as they leave the premises. And specifically, we say we will have security and stewards along the egress routes. Um, so so that, isn't, that isn't just simply a promise. Uh, we are volunteering a condition. Um, again, um, turning to the litter and waste management, which begins at, par at uh, paragraph 128, um, you will see there um, that we include a strategy um, which um, deals with collection of litter, etc. Um, what I would suggest is that that condition is actually amended slightly so that there are two extra bullet points added to it. Um, the first bullet point I would suggest is that we add as part of the strategy, litter collection and street cleaning to agreed areas off site, and also add uh, a second extra bullet point, uh, refuse and waste response teams. So in other words, the strategy is going to address those two points as well as all the others. Um, that suggestion is just to make it clearer that we are not only uh, committed to clearing the site, but also off-site. I'll now move on to traffic and transport. Um, there are several concerns about this. Can I, can I break it down into two? Um, first of all, transport. 
um, and, and then I'll deal with traffic and parking um, after that. Um, we are in a position now where we've prepared our first draft of the traffic and transport plan, and we're trying to make arrangements um, for that plan to be considered prior to Christmas by highways departments and by other relevant um, uh, parties, agencies, who will have in input into those plans. Um, we have actually been liaising with regard to public transport um, with the relevant authorities uh, since September. Um, and we have produced um, a transport model, what, which is um, the usual way of starting and then um, progressing um, the transport plan. That transport model um, considers all of the uh, types of um, transport, public transport. So for example, the trains, the buses, taxis, coaches, um, and indeed it, it goes on to establish the pedestrian traffic. We estimate um, the number of persons that will be taking each form of transport, and that is worked out based on experience of other types of event. And of course, we have that experience in London. We are also um, using a uh, local uh, company um, to assist um, with this modeling. Um, with, with the transport model, um, we obviously take into account the ingress where there is a greater spread period and the egress where there is a shorter period. Um, we make sure that we have sufficient capacity um, within our model um, to move the whole of the audience um, in a reasonable period of time. And that, for instance, has caused us to have conversations regarding train services. Um, and that discussion is focusing on more trains and or um, additional train coaches. And those discussions um, have been very fruitful and have uh, moved forward significantly even within the last week. Um, moving on to um, traffic, um, of course, we make provision, that we make provision first of all, um, to actively discourage people coming to the event um, in cars. We're promoting travel by public transport. Um, we do that um, on the internet. We do that when we send out uh, tickets. Um, it, um, it, it is, again, it is a system which has worked um, for other events. So we have uh, some confidence in that. Um, we also, um, of course, make provision for um, disabled uh, persons to be able to drive to the site. We make provision for access for the emergency services. And we have a taxi pickup of and drop off drop off point um, on the site, which is um, built into our plans. Um, we have signage plans. Um, we investigate whether road closures are necessary and for over what periods. So it is a very, very uh, comprehensive uh, plan that is eventually put together and is scrutinized um, by all of the authorities through the multi-agency forum and that plan has to be approved. Um, the other thing which has taken place as well is a very fruitful meeting with residents on the 10th of November where certain concerns were uh, fed, fed back to us such as signage, poor lighting in certain areas and what, what we could call difficult traffic hotspots um, in any event. Um, Mr. Probin was at that meeting and at the time, and it's minuted, he, des he described the information that he was receiving as being priceless um, and he was referring to congestion, which is um, experienced on normal days. Um, there is a suggestion that um, there is to be a subgroup involving uh, a representative or representatives from the residents um, who can have direct input 
um, into the uh, traffic plan uh, which we are uh, creating. Um, there's also been some concern about who can actually manage traffic. Um, we employ a London-based traffic management company who have licensed stewards who have jurisdiction um, to manage traffic. One other element that cropped up um, in discussions and in the representations is the management of parking. Um, this is a problem that is, uh, has been encountered at other venues. And um, we, have, um, we have various plans which can be put into place, which need to be put, put in place on a multi-agency basis by involving all boroughs, for example, and the police um, and the local authorities and their own enforcement officers. So, um, for example, um, we publicise that, it, that there is no off-site parking. We publicise this on the website. We publicise it in tickets. Um, there is a complaints line where residents can make complaints to us. Um, we can send out stewards. We will have stewards outside the event anyway. We can have stewards where there are what I termed as hot spots, whether it be junctions or whether it be particular access roads where residents want some measure of control. Uh, for example, uh, some residents ask for their for signs to be put up at the end of the road, saying that there will be access and for that to be steward stewarded. We require for residents and visitors so that they're not inconvenienced. Um, we have signs which go away areas so that tickets can be issued if, if cars are found to be parked where they shouldn't be, we have arrangements for, for them to be towed away. Um, arrangements are made with enforcement officers so that parking tickets will be issued, but prior warnings about this are all taken place. So there are a number of measures which can be worked out, uh, which will help with that as well. Um, I'm, I'm now going to move on to COVID-19. Um, and I am, I am I'm doing that. There is already a succinct condition at condition 109, which shows that um, this is within our mind and consideration. Um, first of all, um, first of all, I think it was suggested that we're highly irresponsible, even suggesting a, a uh, uh, an event uh, for next year. Well. With respect, that is not the case because the position is that if the guidance says that there should not be an event next year, there will not be an event this year. And it, you know, it will be noted that um, both Live Nation and Festival Republic have willingly cancelled in advance uh, their own festivals in 2019 um, because the guidance could not be complied with, guidance with regard to gatherings and social distancing. So they are not trying to do that um, if it is necessary. What is required is that a, uh, basically a COVID, um, a COVID risk assessment um, has to be carried out um, by any promoter and that must take into account um, all of the guidance. The guidance is currently um, a moving feast. So, for example, there was certain guidance issued on the 28th of August, when things were looking better, um, for um, festivals um, to start moving again. Um, but that, that became impossible um, with... Uh, conditions that were necessarily applied to gatherings and social distancing. Um, so the position is that we will obviously monitor um, what is happening at great pace, um, particularly exciting, um, which I've seen as I've walked out uh, from here, is the latest movement um, with um, regard to vaccination. And over the year, 
this will be a topic will, which will be constantly monitored through the SAG process. And you will recall at the outset, the SAG process, we are suggesting that there should be a meeting um, every month. But the final position is this, that if guidance says that there shouldn't be a festival, there should not be events, then there will not be events. And you should take that for comfort. The final thing that um, I wanted to mention is two things that I'm not going to speak to. Um, I have not spoken at all um, to aspects relating to the preservation and protection of the site and its assets. These are very important matters, but they are catered for in the agreement between the applicant and the trust. They are not licensing issues. Uh, nevertheless, I can say that they've not been overlooked and they are provided for. The second thing that I'm not going to address is the issue of the benefits to the community and to um, Crystal Palace Park uh, by permitting these uh, events. Um, this is well articulated elsewhere in the representations and I think there are others who are better placed uh, to address you on that. Um, that is my presentation and obviously there's been a lot of information I've passed to you which I hope deals with many of the issues um, in, this, um, in this application. And we're very happy now um, to field any questions that you may, you may have arising from that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Taylor, for a most comprehensive presentation. It's pretty much addressed all the uh, questions I had to um, ask you, um, particularly on the issue of COVID. I just have one other to add, um, and that is you've applied for um, a three-year license. Is this typical of your applications on other occasions and to other authorities? And have you in the past applied for a one-year license? Thank you. Um, right. Um, what, what, I, what I can say is that um, it, it, it is quite typical to apply for a multi-year license. Um, and so, for example, for some of the events that I uh, spoke about earlier in this presentation, some of those events had uh, 15 year, well, one had a 15 year license, uh, others had a license uh, which is colloquially called a perpetual license. Uh, what I can say from my experience in the London parks with this client and other clients, that the um, periods for the license are often tailored to the length of the license that the site can be used. And so it is, in my experience, uh, quite normal to have a three or four year license um, for events in the London parks um, at the present time. Thank you very much. That's all I've got to ask. Uh, Councillor Evans, do you have any questions for the applicant, please? The applicant's advisor, I should say. Uh, yeah, yes, well, one or two, if I can, uh, Madam Chairman. And thank you very much, Mr. Taylor, as, as the chairman said, for a, um, a very comprehensive, um, exhaustive, and possibly for you, exhausting, I, I don't know, um, situation. But certainly, um, it is obviously um, a very professional. It, it is a very um, well organized situation. And I have no doubt at all that if the uh, festival was run, then your organisation will run it as well as it could possibly be organised. You seem to have covered all the eventualities. But um, I would take issue with a couple of things. Um, firstly, the the noise. If perhaps I can refer to Mr Griffiths, was it, um, uh, about the noise plan, etc.? I think that one thing that I would certainly not agree with in the Vanguardia uh, report is this situation is the uh, comment on complaints. 
Um, if only as councillors, I could say to all the complaints I have on various things that, uh, you know, your complaint is purely a subjective issue and I've got no reason to consider it. Um, I've got to look at some mathematical formula to to decide what to do. I'm afraid that's not how the real world works. And that what we have to do here is actually to listen to complaints. Um, and I think if I may say so, the Vanguardia comment on uh, complaints is, is, is a little bit uh, incorrect um, when they say, consequently, complaints should not be used on their own as an indicator of impact. Well, not on their own. Of course, there are other issues, but um, certainly we must consider complaints. And, and that's really part of, of, of what we should be doing here. Um, I think that could I ask a question about um, the noise levels? I was particularly struck. I mean, th there is a code of conduct um, wh which is spelt out, um, which then both reports on noise seem to spend most of their time saying, well, there is a code of conduct, but we don't really take much notice of it. Um, and it really shouldn't be there. And it's going to be changed, but it is actually still there. And as I understand it, with regard to this area, the MNLA should be, according to the guidelines, 65 decibels. Um, now, later on in, in the report, in the Vanguardia report on page 14, it refers that the MNLA should not exceed 90 decibels um, at any residential property. Well, that's way above. I mean, considering that um, the decibel, if it goes up 10, isn't it? that means it's doubling, um, is, is a fantastic amount. So perhaps I could have a comment on that. Good, good, good morning, Councillor. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes, thank you very much for your points. First of all, yeah, I, I must apologise with respect to the complaints. Of course, they're extremely important. And um, I, I, what I did qualify that was by saying not on its own. So, of course, complaints are important and we do take them very seriously. So apologies if, if you've, you've um, seen that as a, a problem. But yes, we do take complaints. We have a complaints hotline and, and we monitor the complaints in real time. So that as complaints come in and if there's a hot spot, then we use those complaints. You know, and we also ask people, the low frequency is at the base, is the high frequency, can you hear the vocals? All that information is really, really important for us to help manage this event. So um, I absolutely take your point on that. What I was saying is that there are other factors as well we need to take account of, such as level, such as time of day and so on. Um, but of course we take complaints um, into account. In respect of the code, um, I was on the original working party for the code published in 1995. Um, therefore, you know, I, at that time I stood by the code and I still, in many cases, do stand by the code. Some very useful information in there. The thing is that things have changed since in, over the 20 years, since the research that a lot of work I carried out, I've carried out a lot new research. And um, what we're finding is that just on the point of the 90, the 90 is a different unit, it's DBC. That is completely different to the DBA that you're referring to, the 65 DBA. The DBC is something that I've offered up, and I've offered it up, and it, what it does, it looks particularly at the low frequency, at this base. And this base is something that you know, people are complaining more and more about. So I offered that as a, an additional condition. In 95, we weren't sure what the condition should be when it comes to the low frequency base. But now from research, we found that if you can keep below the 90 dB C, which is very different to the DBA weighting, because basically it takes into account all the frequencies, in particularly the low frequency. So the DBC is something that we've offered up to control the actual base frequencies. Um, and that is now being, we're seeing that come into more and more um, parks. And what we're also seeing is that most parks are adopting 75 dBA. So just to be absolutely clear, there's two conditions here. 75 dBA, which is as you would hear it. And then there's the 90 dBC, which is this low frequency condition, which does protect the residents from this low frequency base beam. 
Right. Okay. I, I, I think I understood most of that. <laughs> Stay there. Um, could I ask you one other thing? Um, it's with regard to the various uh, numbers that you're giving me, and, uh, and I understand the difference between DBA and DBC. Um, it's a question of whether when there's a time period associated with that uh, reading, uh, as it were, um, does it mean that the sound levels, decibels, are cumulative over a period of time? Um, I can only refer back to... No, nothing whatever to do with this particular um, sort of case that we're looking at. But with regard to Biggin Hill Airport, uh, I still bear the scars of trying to understand the sound um, sort of consultant's views on the amount of decibels over a certain period of time. It can be a cumulative experience. And I only say that because if you set limits and then you say, well, in order to um, try to make sure our headline events acts can be much louder, then if the lower ones are of a lower decibel, um, if the early events are, are, are very low decibels, then that means that when we come to the finale, they can really give it a blast. Um, now, do, do, does that make any sense, what I'm saying? Or, or maybe you can correct me on that. Uh, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what we do here is it, it's not cumulative. It's not something that builds up or you're as we're seeing on the COVID-19 where you have this moving average over seven days. Every 15 minute, every 15 minute is reset, reset, reset. So we're looking at the last 15 minutes. Now, as uh, Mr. Taylor said, we, we go beyond that. We look at it every one minute. So we're monitoring every one minute to make sure that we've got the control over the 15 minutes. And then after that 15 minutes ends, start again on a new 15 minute and that's very very important the, the, the issue of aircraft noise and i worked for the glc at um Biggin hill and did a lot of work on there is that a lot of those averages are over 16 hours and the problem there is you're 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 watering down perhaps the energy of shorter events but when it comes to music the music we look at it in every 15 minute chunks so it's not about well, because we were 10 dB below at the beginning, we've got another 10 dB to go and, and we've, we, we can yeah. then water down the effect. No, every 15 minutes is reset. And I hope that answers. Right. That's OK. Fine. Yes, the, thank you very much. It certainly does. Um, and could, Madam Chairman, if I could ask a couple of more questions of Mr. Taylor. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, to, to the general uh, situation. First of all, the timings. Um, of the um, of when alcohol is available to, to be sold and indeed when the event goes on. Um, have we a big enough gap between when alcohol sales stop and when uh, hopefully the site will be cleared? Um, right. As, as far as the uh, timings are concerned, um, the reality is in, a, in, a, in an application we have to put in the maximum times in which, during which we may want to, uh, to sell alcohol and the closing of the event. So that is the maximum periods that we might want to sell site anywhere, to sell alcohol anywhere on the site. The reality of the situation is that we have, uh, within the alcohol management plan, um, a schedule of when um, bars, etc., are going to be both opened and closed. And what we have is we have what's known as a phased, um, a phased closing of bars. So as part of the discussions within, um, with, with the police and with the other authorities, um, we agree a schedule for the closing of bars. So it, it isn't a matter of it, of it being the equivalent, if you, if you don't pardon me saying this, of it being a series of pulps which all turn out at a particular time or whatever. That isn't how um, the, um, the event is organised in practice. Right. OK, thank you very much for that. Well, one other point, if I may, Madam Chairman, um, and that's concerning um, the, the actual application. I, I can understand the application for 
live music, recorded music, alcohol sales and, and whatever. What I'm interested in is, is the other similar events. Now, a couple of the complainants uh, mentioned that in, in their notes and said, what could this be? Could this be uh, political events, uh, religious events or, or whatever? What, what sort of things are you um, thinking about when, when you ask permission to have other similar events? Councillor Evans, perhaps I should answer that, um, Melvin Ben. Um, it, it's certainly not political, certainly not religious, um, but it may be that we would, uh, for example, have a, um, uh, a, um, a sort of perhaps an exhibition event of a sporting nature that would, um, uh, you, you know, for example, that would still require an entertainment license because there would be um, celebrities there and music artists there, you know, for example, and uh, and uh, you know pub the uh, public amplif amplification um, involved in it, and and that's certainly one of the things that I'm looking at for uh, the second weekend. Um, it's not confirmed yet, councillor, so therefore it's difficult to be very mm. specific about it. Um, uh, but it is something that would be slightly different to a regular music event. Um, albeit it would be licensed within the terms of a music event because it ha it would have uh, live uh, music amplification going on during it. Right. Definitely okay. nothing political. Definitely nothing political. Definitely, I'm going definitely to nothing really. <laughs> I was thinking of booking you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, th thank you very much for, for that. Um, my last comment, Madam Chair, if I may, um, it goes back to, to your question, really, about multi-year um, licensings being awarded. Um, I, I think, as I said earlier, I, I've been much impressed by Mr. Taylor's presentation and, and the sort of um, monitoring and the sort of organisation that would ensue if, um, if we allowed the, this event to, to go ahead. Um, I think that looking at the plans and the theoretical plans and how everything is organised and the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and everything else is, is an important issue. But another one is experience, experience of, of that event at that venue. And therefore, at this moment in time, I'd much prefer if we were going to give you a licence to say for one year and then have a real look as to how that went. Uh, because I think that obviously many residents are concerned about the effects and we need to know, we need to see before we allow a multi-year thing, I think, um, to have a look at how the first thing, how, how the first organisation went. So how would you react to the suggestion that we only give you a one-year licence? I'll answer that uh, question if I may. Um, for, first of all, uh, there may be certain um, commercial issues, um, and, I, and I say that um, because um, this is a question that's posed uh, at many of the applications um, that are made. Um, so there may be commercial issues so that, uh, for example, um, it may well be that a promoter has a commercial three-year plan to make the event work um, not necessarily commercial in the first year, but is prepared to build the event, to build the venue, because it's a new venue, um, as you say. And so, so basically there needs to be some leeway for a um, commercial enterprise to be able to build this event so that at the end of the day, um, it can be commercially successful. That is a very important consideration for the promoter. Mm, that sorry. is not... That is not necessarily um, a licensing issue. Um, what I have said to other committees is that we put these plans together for the first year um, and we have built into the process um, a very robust um, process. There is a debrief um, where a new plan, obviously built on the previous plan, has to be built every year. You heard me say earlier that it's one of Mr. Ben's strengths that supposing this year is very successful, he will not sit on his haunches and pray at his back, his own back. 
he will look for improvements that can be made because that is what he has to do in this industry. Um, look for constant improvements and tweaks here, tweaks there. And I have to say that that is generally how SAG and the responsible authorities um, um, act. So they, in a debrief, they look at the planning for next year and the improvements that can be made. And that is what happens um, in practice. So first of all, I would say to you, you should have no fear that um, you need one year to suck it and see um, how it goes, because all of the planning is going to be put in, which is very substantial, which is going to make the first year work. The second year uh, will be better naturally because of experience, but the process allows that and works to achieve that um, with the conditions um, that are there. Um, so I, I think you should have no fear. Moreover, moreover, I, I can also say this, that if the learnings were not learnt and the second year's event management plan is not right, then the licensing authority can stop the event from happening. I can also mention to you um, what is the statutory remedy for an event which shouldn't take place, which of course is a review, the review of the license. And that has been put there for the very purpose that you're talking about, the statutory right of review. And that isn't a right just for a licensing authority, it is a right for the responsible authorities and of course the residents. So right. the safeguards are there. Good, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. That's all the questions I have at the moment. You're welcome, Councillor Evans. Um, Councillor Allen, I'm sure you have some questions if you'd like to go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for a very thorough presentation, um, Mr Taylor and uh, colleagues. We, um, I did have one or two questions, but to some extent they've been covered. I, I, was asked, I wanted to ask about the viability if the time limit is, if, if the licence is granted for one year rather than three, and I think to some extent you've answered that. And also viability if the noise levels were reduced, because presumably um, some acts wouldn't want to perform if, um, in certain circumstances. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, 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 sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Now, that's a very good point. It, it would be very easy for me to sit here and say, yes, we can just turn it down, we can turn it down and turn it down. But there is a point which, uh, um, for audience and for the artist, that it starts to become an ineffective form of entertainment. So at a certain level, and we, we did a lot of research with Michael Jackson at the time in the, the, in the late 80s, that below a certain level, um, you lose the event. So um, it isn't just, we, we can control it as much as we can in terms of covering the audience. You can't go below a certain level, um, and especially for the main acts. And you're absolutely right that one of the first questions that I know um, Ben quite again asked is, what, what noise can we, what noise can we make at this venue? And some will not, or some will just really won't now play it unless there is a sufficient level to provide the audience satisfaction that's required. So it's clearly this balance of, you know, providing that for the for the audience, but also safeguarding the the noise nuisance aspects for the community. Can I just add as well that I think, uh, if I could just add, add on that point, I think as well, um, there are very helpful comparisons in the Vanguardia report about noise levels at other venues. And so Mr. Griffiths is absolutely right. Um, if this level, is, sorry, if the levels at Crystal Palace um, are not feasible, um, then acts will just simply not come here because, frankly, there are choices elsewhere uh, within London. Yeah, thank you. I, I, had, I had noted that and um, it's not unusual for the London Borough of Bromley to be out on a limb over various things, but um, I think it's fairly clear for this one that um, it would probably be better if we weren't, if, if we approved this. Is that all your questions, Councillor Allen? 
Um, if I can just come back to Mr. Taylor again, just following up on uh, one of Councillor uh, Evans' points, just about the egress. Um, obviously, it's a huge amount of people. Um, if uh, serving of alcohol stops at 10.30 and the event ends at 11, obviously, by the time everybody is dispersed, that could be well after midnight. Um I'm just wondering elsewhere whether they've uh, agreed to such late hours of license, licensing alcohol. And typically on an event of this size, how long does it take for people to disperse? Thank you. Well, um, f first of all, in the body of the license, um, there is an end to um, the licensable activities at 10.30, and there is a closing, a terminal hour of the site, uh, a closing of the site for 11. So, so therefore, what we have done um, is we have built into, um, we've, we've effectively built into it, a 30 minute egress phase to close the site um, so that we can, um, uh, and, by, and by that, um, that will be the vast, vast majority of the audience will leave. Um, what you must remember as well is that um, with, with music events, and indeed you see with sports events as well, um, the audience doesn't necessarily stay to the end. Um, with music, it may well be, uh, particularly of the types of, um, of, of main events that Mr. Ben is talking about, uh, people will come and see artists who may be playing earlier than the very last event. Um, people choose the artists they want to see, where it's a multi, multi stage, where there's more than one stage, and where there are many artists who are performing, uh, because it's good value to see them, um, uh, frankly. Um, so, so there, there will be, um, there will not be a total egress of uh, 45,000 people at, for example, 10:30 or 11 o'clock. The egress will be uh, more gentle than that, but um, it, you're quite right to point out that the majority of the audience uh, will be leaving at uh, 10.30. Um, but in our plan, we, we build up, um, uh, we build up that we are able to clear the site. We then carry out a, uh, what I would call um, a sweep to remove all of the stragglers um, uh, from the site as well, um, so so it may it may take a, a few minutes longer, and so we build in uh, another fifteen minutes or so than that. But we expect to clear the site um, within the thirty minutes. Um, and just just a couple of uh, an anecdotes I've mentioned to you. Um, if you look at a football ground when they're interviewing uh, when they're interviewing people pitch side, and you notice that the stands. Are within 10 minutes completely empty um, behind. Uh, so, so this isn't a fantastic proposition I'm putting forward to you at all. Um, I also remember Victoria Park uh, clearing um, 40 odd thousand people and the superintendent of police advised the committee um, that the site was cleared within that 30 minutes. Um, so, so that is not a fantastic proposition I'm putting to you together. That is the reality. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Evans, Alan, anything to come back on? Any further questions before I ask Mr Phillips? No, thank you. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr Phillips, do you have questions, please? Um, I just have one, which is just a point for clarity. Uh, this, um, this application is for six event days but we're talking as if it's one event. So are we talking one event six days long or several two days or whatever? Could I just get some clarity there, please? Um, Mr. Phillips, it would be uh, for two three-day weekends. Um, the first weekend uh, would be uh, one event uh, and the second weekend um, would be three separate day events. Um, obviously, the first weekend is three separate days, but they would be encompassed within one event. 
um, and people would go to and from each day. Uh, the second weekend would be three uh, very different events on each of the three days. Okay, would, this, would these be on concurrent weekends or two months apart, for example? Uh, concurrent weekends, the weekends of the 9, 10, 11 of July uh, and the weekend of the uh, 16, 17, 18 of July next year. Lovely, that was the only thing I wanted to clear up, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe I can now ask the objectors if they have any questions for Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Ms. Patricia Bramble, thank you. You're on mute. I still can't hear you. Sorry, try again. That's sounding promising. Try, hello? No, you're still on mute. No, it's still muted. So you need to click it once, not twice. No, we can't hear you. Click it once. Then pass, on, then pass on to someone else, please. No, I can hear you now. Oh, that's a I can hear you now. So if I've you would almost... like to um, ask your question, thank you. I've almost forgotten my question after that. Um, I think it's, it's really in terms of the egress and access uh, points. I, I'm still puzzled as to how 50,000, 45,000 people can leave a venue in 30 minutes, even allowing for the fact that it may be staged leaving of the venue, not everyone stays till the end. They may leave the venue, but what happens to them then? So we've now got 45,000 people potentially not able to get on trains uh, because of the lack of trains and transport. We don't know nothing about the transport plan yet. What do you do with the crowds after they've funneled through the gates? How many gates are proposed? How many exits are proposed? For the site. I've got some figures from a different venue uh, in, in uh, Brockwell Park, uh, which was well, in, in 2018, where the egress figures there for a smaller crowd, it was about 35,000. And they estimated that with two exits um, in Brockwell Park, one on Brixton Water Lane and the other in the middle of Herne Hill, it would take uh, half an hour for only 26,000 people to actually exit through the gates. Perhaps you could expand on that for me, please. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on that, um, uh, Patricia, if that's OK. Um, we, 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 have, um, we have a fairly... Um, uh, we have a comprehensive egress plan as part of all of the events we do. Um, uh, you know, we have a number of... Uh, events in Gunnersbury Park and um, uh, Finsbury Park and uh, on Blackheath, for example, where um, you know these same numbers, not on Blackheath, but certainly Gunnersbury Park and Finsbury Park and, and Clapham Common, where these same amounts of numbers of people um, uh, do leave uh, from uh, multiple exits um, and uh, they are cleared uh, within 30 minutes very comfortably, and I, I, when I say very comfortably, I mean very comfortably. Um, of course, they then go into uh, queuing systems for the public transport um, uh, positions uh, at the varying train stations, um, and, and, and we manage those queuing uh, uh, positions, uh, and we uh, manage to get rid of the people uh, very quickly indeed. It, it's, it's um, I, I think, for me, um, it, it is surprisingly straightforward um, in the way that people do egress uh, and do load onto the trains uh, and other forms of public transport, really. Um, I, I can understand it feels like a lot of people, um, but it, 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 it's, it's very normal for what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, are there un any other questions? Philippa, can I ask? 
Chairman, I can't see anyone else who's indicating they wish to ask a question. OK, thank you very much. In that case, it is now over to the presenter. Yeah, case. And I can't see... I can't see the person who's going to present for the objectors. Do you see anybody there, Philippa? Uh, Ms. Okay. Her hand up. Gender. Yes. Okay, Patricia Bramble, if you'd like to um, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, my thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'm just going to start off by saying how disappointed I was not to receive the condi planning conditions which formed about 45 minutes or seemed like 45 minutes of the statement made by the applicant. We had nothing, that was, those weren't available on the website. We were completely in the dark about what he was discussing and that really has certainly not being able to read those in advance of this meeting has left us at a distinct disadvantage. Um, we couldn't follow what was being said at the time in reference to the various pages or conditions. Please may I make a plea for any other future licensing hearings that you make that to make sure that these things are made available. In my, in my limited experience of speaking at licensing um, uh, licensing hearings, all, those pa all that paperwork is made freely available to everybody, not just to say the councillors, obviously, most importantly, it goes to the councillors, but it seems to have gone to those in support of the event, but not the objectors. That's all I'm going to say on that. But I really feel that our hands have been tied well and truly. Um, to speak, um, uh, my brief, I belong to a thing called the Dulwich Society, which has about 1,400 members. I actually live on Fountain Drive, which is a road which is halfway towards Sydenham Hill Station, one of the routes which will probably one of the train stations which will probably be used um, for this event. Um, so the Dulwich Society approved uh, my speaking on this occasion. I've also had the backup of the Sydenham Society, another uh, very well known and thought well, very well thought of amenity society in Sydenham, who submitted their representation, but it didn't appear amongst the objections on the website. So I am actually, uh, our views, particularly as both representatives of the Sydenham Society and I and other local residents attended the meeting referred to with John Probin um, some 10 days ago. So I feel that what I say is echoed by those other people who were present at that meeting. Um, what the applicant is proposing, 15, 50, 45,000 people a day coming three days in a row and then five days later up to the same number of people. We haven't really had time to recover from the first influx of people into this grade two star listed park. Potentially, it's an influx of 300,000 people into the park in a 10 day period. Um, We've listened to what the uh, applicant has said, but really we're not much the wiser. In fact, we're none the wiser, and I don't know how the committee can be as to what type of events are planned. We've just been told one, the first uh, weekend is a three-day event, and then the second is a series of quite separate individual events, uh, completely self almost self-contained events, some, th some uh, five days later. What is quite clear, though, is that the objective of this event is to permit the applicant to hold these festivals for a three year period in return for a payment. Money, amount and conditions attached to which are said to be commercially confidential and money which the trust will invest in the park. At this point, I have to say that for the last 20 years, I have been a supporter of getting improvements into the park. But this isn't the way, in my mind, this is not the way to do it. Um, in deciding on this application, the committee needs to balance the benefits of granting the licence against any adverse effects to the public, local residents and businesses. You've heard how um, the plans will be um, structured so that uh, and how they will be managed, but no hard facts. Yes, they will be presented within a time period before the event, 
before the first day of the event. And the applicant, who undoubtedly is very experienced in running large events, wants to reassure you that everything will be all right on the night. That is not satisfactory from my point of view. Three months before the event draft management event has to be submitted, in early April, just after Easter, according to the government, we may still well be living under the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. And the applicant's uh, representative was good enough to spell out in, good, in great detail that obviously if social distancing is still an issue, then there won't be an event. Um, I said to start off with, um, and I'd like to, I really would like to read the papers which were presented to the responsible authorities in Bromley and which satisfied Bromley's own public health and nuisance team. It gave me grave concern just to see the statement on the application of papers that they were dissatisfied with what they'd heard and they objected to the performance. I would like to see those papers. Obviously, it'll be too late, but I'd like to be, have those uh, and other local residents would too to be satisfied so we can be satisfied that the public health and nuisance team it, uh, has got good grounds for their um, satisfaction with the events. One thing that was touched on very briefly was um, the consultation with the four other local authorities bordering the park, Southwark, Lewisham, Croydon, and to a lesser extent, Lambeth. Um, have they been consulted so far? Uh, the conditions that were read out and were in the report we haven't seen, were they consulted on those? Bromley's residents are really, it's not really a Bromley event, particularly it's a local, it's a local area event. The park belongs to everybody. All five local authority uh, residents use the park regularly. So just to have the views of the Bromley Safety Advisory Group signing off the plan doesn't meet my objections. Um, right, public nuisance. Um, we've got, let me just go back on one other thing. We've got the idea that we have six event days uh, per year in the application. We don't have to have six, we could have a lesser number. And that partially touches on Councillor Evans' remarks as to why, um, so that we could be satisfied, we don't have to suck it and we, we have time to suck it and see. If, for example, in year one, there were only one event run, say the first three day event, but it didn't actually go on into the next weekend. Just a thought but one I would, I would strongly advocate. We don't know about the types of music um, which are planned for any of the six days at the moment. Um, and the applicant, certainly at the meeting uh, we had 10 days ago uh, with John Probin, he, he did say that different music attracts different kinds of people, um, festival goers who drink a lot and festival goers who don't. Um, there are some fairly graphic press reports about as well as some first-hand reports in objections which you have seen about the levels of nuisance, social antisocial anti behaviour, violence and drug dealing in Finsbury Park during the wireless festival promoted by the applicant. Can we have an undertaking please from the applicant that wireless will never come to Crystal Palace Park and an assurance from the trust they will not permit it. But whatever the type of music, it's going to be played continuously for 11 and a half hours each day at a level that satisfies event goers more than local residents. That's one thing that has to be taken into account when balancing the, uh, the, um, the, the, the terms which the local authority has to consider. In the, in the um, application, or sorry, in the first draft of the noise report, which was available with the event papers at page 15, it, it talks about um, residents living to the north and the south of the event site being most uh, likely to suffer from excess noise. That means hundreds of people. This will constitute a major nuisance to them and disruption of their right of quiet enjoyment. As to other loss of amenity, I ask you, local, uh, uh, um, Madam Chairman, and your colleagues to consider what will happen when up to 45,000 people each day come and choke up all the public transport points and the surrounding narrow streets, crossings and shops. Gridlock is inevitable. Crystal Palace and surrounding areas will be no place for locals. The remaining areas of the park itself 
will almost certainly be treated as effectively closed off during the period the festival is in operation. The terraces which form a large part of the park will be fenced off for almost a month in the height of summer uh, when you include set up and take down. That's a sizable loss of amenity for regular park users, many of whom families with children do not have the luxury of a garden. And I raise the issue of whether residents living locally will even be able to use their gardens because of the music noise while the festival is taking place. Uh, no matter how many stewards the applicant will provide, I think a figure was mentioned uh, by the applicant's representative of on one occasion 350 students, uh, uh, stewards, partly, um, stewards on one occasion. It's very difficult for um, purely some, someone who doesn't organise events to grapple with actually how many people that means in the roads, in each of the roads surrounding the site to escort people to the, to the six local stations. There are concerns raised not just by me, but by many other objectors uh, in their written representations of the antisocial behaviour. Yes, the applicant's representative has touched on it, but all the reports one reads, irrespective of the care that is taken by the applicant, there is drunkenness, shouting, urination, excess littering, it will occur. I, I really think from, from, the, from the objector's point of view, it is the size of the crowd and the, the late night surge of people leaving the event site that causes concern. Yes, we appreciate that event goers will be encouraged to use public transport. I'm glad to hear that. But if one looks, if you do, do a comparison with the events in Finsbury Park, um, they have tube lines. They're very lucky. The, the Piccadilly line can carry between 800 and 900 passengers an hour. And, the, and that line runs about every 10 minutes. The Victoria line is much more frequent, similar sort of numbers of people. But if you look at those figures totaled up, they alone can take 25,000 people away from the festival site in an hour. In contrast, trains from our local stations to central London and Croydon vary uh, four to six an hour, less in the evenings, and all finish at midnight. I accept that the... Uh, Applicants' representative talked about uh, negotiations with uh, local transport, uh, London Transport, to have more trains and more coaches. That is welcomed, very welcomed. But still, we have the question of the crowds waiting, not necessarily patiently and not necessarily sober, outside stations for trains to take them away from the site. This is going to cause nuisance for local residents, people trying to sleep at midnight, one o'clock in the morning. What about the coaches transporting festival goers from outside London to the park and back? Where are their drop off points? Where do they park all day in narrow local streets? So in summary, really, the event organisers are proposing, proposing to send a tide of 45,000 people a day through busy stations and busy roads adjoining the park. The closing time for sale for, for music and sale of alcohol are both scheduled at the same time. There was discussion that the timing will vary and that in the uh, event plan, those type bars will probably close at different times. It is essential that they do. Think of the difference it will make if bars close, say, an hour before the music ends. I talked in my question to the applicant's representative about the egress calculations for the field day event at Brockwell Park. Um, it, it does cause a big problem at that park. In Crystal Palace Park, I think there are four or five exits marked on the park map. Uh, can, are there all those going to be used or is it purely the ones uh, near the Crystal Palace station or near the, two, near the train station um, in Penge? The, applica the application acknowledges uh, the applicant's duty to deal with prevention of crime and disorder on site. What about off site? Uh, we've talked about there was talk about stewards um, stewarding shepherding people to the stations but that do they have and what do they do about people who are what, what do they do about drug dealing which is so apparent in all the reports that one reads about um, certainly the wireless festival and it's fairly common it has to be said at other festivals too
CCTV installed at agreed locations across the site. Great idea. What about off-site? Is that going to be um, considered? Um, at our meeting with John Probin, we did talk and uh, he picked up our point and it's been mentioned again today about signage. It is essential that people getting off a train, for example, a Gypsy Hill station, they land somewhere about a steep hill. There's no signage there at the moment. Where is Crystal Palace? You can see a transmitter, but that's about it. So signage is, 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 is essential, as is leafleting and notification to residents around the park before the event. The, the question of planning for a blue light emergency, where do ambulances go? Uh, are roads going to be closed off around the park? If, they, if the roads, Crystal Palace Parade, for example, is closed off, that's going to maroon residents and it's going to stop people even going down to Sydenham, going down to their shops and going about their normal business while the park, while the festival in the park is underway. Going back to blue light emergencies, are ambulances going to be stationed on site? Are any of the stewards going to be trained as first aiders? What about defibrillators? Is there a phone line to get through to A&E at local hospitals? Is it Lewisham? Um, is it King's in, in, uh, in Denmark Hill? To summarise, the society maintains the applicant hasn't provided sufficient information to fully address the four licensing objectives. And we urge the licensing committee to reject this application, but it's very probable and we are not um, mindful. We are mindful of the fact that the licensing authority may well accept this application, but impose conditions on it. Well, I suggest a few matters for the uh, licensing committee to suggest as conditions to be imposed on the license. In 2021, or the first year if later, the first year of the event, the event days be limited to three in number. In other words, not just one three day event or three one day events. I don't mind which it is, but not six events. So then we can suck it and see to see if Crystal Palace Park is a suitable place in this day and age for the kind of event that the applicant is, is considering to promote. Secondly, in each event year, the maximum capacity should be not 45,000 um, attendees. It should be a lower figure, say 35,000 ticket holders, possibly 35,000 to include everybody, all up figure of 35,000. That may have an effect commercially, yes, but that's not my problem. That's the applicant's problem. I would hope that the two, three day events, if there are going to be six event days, they're not held on successive weekends. In the event of a major problem or disturbance during the first of those two events, there isn't sufficient time for a, certainly not for a license review or to change the event management plan or even to any great extent, the ingress or egress plan. It may be more, more cost effective for the applicant to hold the event on consecutive weekends. I can understand that, but it will result in local residents being in virtual lockdown for six out of 10 days each July. Timing of licensed entertainment, please, not, tw uh, not later than 2200 hours on Fridays and Saturdays and 2100 hours on Sundays. Sale of alcohol to cease one hour before licensed entertainment ceases. CCTV to be installed outside the perimeter of the festival site, if possible. We've talked about stewards lining the routes to all six nearby train stations and the bus garage. Good. Yes, please. It's essential, as is signage to the venue from all the stations that that should be installed. And Mr. Probin did indicate that that may be installed not just as a temporary, but as a permanent measure. Security to conduct regular patrols of the park after the site is closed to deter festival goers from camping and sleeping overnight in the park. Daily refuse collections, that's been touched on by the applicant and is welcome. Noise monitoring stations and acceptable levels of each location to be agreed by Bromley, but with the noise teams of the adjacent boroughs, not just Bromley. This is not just a Bromley event. And that the same goes also for the ingress and egress um, reports. It is essential the other local authorities who control the traffic, for example, in the, in the boroughs surrounding the park, not just Bromley, but Croydon, Lambeth, Lewisham and Southwark are consulted and their views taken into account. 
parking. Cross-border enforcement, parking enforcement, yes, please. Because ha however much people say, don't come by park, don't come by car, there's going to be parking everywhere. And so there has to be stringent parking enforcement, not just in Bromley, but a coordinated effort, coordinated effort to ensure that parking is enforced across the five boroughs. And then advanced warning leaflets distributed to all wards adjacent to the park at least a month before the event to give those that live nearby and who feel strongly about the future of Crystal Palace Park, just in the same way as Crystal Palace Park Trust do, plenty of time to avoid the site. And so they are fully notified of what's going to hit them in July next year and for the following years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bramble. Um... Unmuted. Thank you very much, Miss Bramble. Um, now, I'm just wondering, because I think Mr. Taylor will probably want to come back on some of those points, whether it now isn't an opportune time to take a five minute break, because it's been quite a lengthy meeting. Um, so I'm suggesting five minutes and I'd like to speak with Councillor Evans and Alan and Mr. Phillips offline. Thank you very much. See you in five. Oh, you Right, I'm just...
Okay, we're coming back. Philippa, for your information, are you there? I am here, Councillor Tonicliffe. Marvellous. Thank you very much. What we are intending to do now is, as Ms Bramble has finished, we are going to go to the applicant for questions to her and then any questions from ourselves or our licensing officer. I then propose that we take a 30 minute break and reconvene after 30 minutes to hear Philip Colvin, I believe, who's heading up for the support side of this application and anybody else that wants to speak in support before final questions and summing up. How does that sound? It sounds okay to me, Chairman. I hope everyone else finds it acceptable. Hold on one minute. Um, I'm just waiting for everybody to come back into the meeting and then I can see Ms Bramble has got her hand up. Ms Bramble, I'll come to you when everybody else is in the meeting. Have we got Councillor Evans back yet? Philippa, I'm not going to take her questions until Councillor Evans is back in the meeting. I'm back, Madam Chairman, but as I'm eating a little bit alone, I'm sure you don't want to watch that. Oh, I see. OK, that's fine. OK, Miss Bramble, you had your hand raised. You're on mute. You're on mute. Is that better? Can you hear me, Madam? I can go ahead with your question. You've muted yourself again. Uh, I can I, hear you now. I can hear you I, now. Go ahead. Yes, Madam. I did understand that Mr Patel was also a local resident who might want to speak as well. I wasn't speaking on his behalf. That was all I, I wanted to say. OK, I understand. Um, Mr Patel, you haven't raised your hand. Did you want to speak? Uh, yes, please. Sorry, I've just come back into the meeting. Um, I have uh, three points really which are related to numbers duration and noise uh, so the first point I'd like to make relates to numbers so as the applicant representative has said the actual number of people um, proposed to attend is approximately 50,000 people um, on each of the days um, I agree with Ms Bramble that 50,000 is an exceedingly large number of people. Now, there may have been a risk assessment done that says that the location is suitable for that number of people. I would disagree on various reasons. Firstly, as a resident who's lived in this area for a number of years and has been present, I live basically a stone's throw from the Fisherman's Gate, which is um, the applicant may not know, but this is not far from their sound monitoring station number four. And I've been present at various events which I've had far fewer people. For example, with the uh, Jamaican Schools Festival, which um, has taken place. Um, and I just cannot believe that the park can basically deal with that number of people and neither can the local area. The transport issues that Ms. Bramble has mentioned are also of a major concern. As I said, um, I live on Crystal Palace Park Road. This is an incredibly busy road at the best of times. Uh, moving on to my second point, which relates to the duration. The applicant has applied for a multi-year uh, permit for three years, and on each of those three years, it would be three days followed by another three days. I again strongly agree with Ms Bramble that the ideal solution to actually judge the benefit of this event to both the local community, the five boroughs involved, and also to the applicant, the applicant would be to maybe make this a one-year event and after which we can all judge the success, the issues, the benefits that have accrued from this event. Um, the extension of that point about the duration is that, again, as Ms Bramble has said, um, there are many people that use the park 
on a daily basis, all year round. And that basically means that in the summer, for a month, we can't use the park. Now, I've been present at another meeting uh, related to a different event, which was just to um, use the, the laptop, if I can call it that. I think local residents know what I'm referring to. Um, and there are far fewer people involved in that event. Um, and I just think that a multi-year application, if approved, would not be beneficial until we can judge one year's event, whether that's three days or whether it is, as the applicant requested, or three days followed by a consecutive three days. I think that would be an, an equitable solution for all parties involved. Um, I'm a local resident. I am aware that whatever my personal feelings are, they have to be balanced with everyone in the local community. That's yes. all of the residents of the five boroughs, the businesses, of course, um, that are nearby. They are also residents. We need to support our local businesses. Um, and the, the final point was uh, related to noise. So we had an in-depth uh, presentation from Vanguardia. Now, what I would like to point out is that um, I know that uh, the applicant has uh, organised events at many, many locations, including, I think, at uh, Stately Park. Now, the situation with Crystal Palace Park is it's built on a slope and it has many trees around it and many residents around it. In fact, if you look at the ONS um, figures for population density, we are a higher population density than most boroughs in London. Um, the average population density is 5,700 per square kilometre. We are 6,400 per square kilometre. Now, the issue with the geography of the park is that, as I've mentioned, being a local resident, I've been here when there have been other festivals involved, that at the location of the festival, the sound level there can be fine. And it could be fine at, for example, let's say three of the monitoring stations that the uh, acoustics company have set up. Now, at the fourth monitoring station, the sound could be incredibly loud. This is partly because of the slope, but also effects, as I'm sure Vanguardia are aware of, such as wind. Now, if the sound level at one station is particularly loud, but at the other three is not particularly loud or above the specified limits of 65 and 90, then what will happen Will that be, well, okay, well, three stations are fine, the fourth station is uh, a, a bit above, well, you know, we're going to keep the sound settings or tell the sound engineers to keep it as the same, or will they reduce it? So that basically, those are my, my three points. So I wholeheartedly agree with Miss Bramble's points, and I would suggest the most equitable decision would be for a one-year permit to be granted, either for three days or for six days. Um, and then all parties involved could then judge the benefit to the local community. And I think that is the one thing I'd like to highlight to all of the councillors. Yes, it must be of benefit to the local community, all five boroughs, all of the businesses, all of the residents. There may be issues for the applicant commercially. That is not our concern. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patel. Uh, now, can I ask if there's anybody else wishing to speak um, in objection to this application at this point, please? This is this will be your last opportunity to speak. I don't see anybody on my screen. Philippa, can you confirm that, please? The chairman, I can't see anyone else indicating they wish to speak. Thank you very much. So I will first go, I think, to Mr. Taylor for any questions to either of the objectors, please. Uh, uh, we don't have any uh, direct questions to either of the um, objectors, uh, but we will address points that they've made in our closing. Thank you. Thank you. That's absolutely fine. So then, Councillor Evans or Councillor Allen, any specific questions to either of the objectors, please? No, no, nothing for me, Madam Chair. No, thanks. Nothing. Councillor Allen? No, thank you. And 
Thank you. And uh, our licensing officer, uh, Mr. Phillips, do you have any questions for the objector, please? No, nothing from me, Madam Chairman. Thank you. OK, it is now approaching 10 to 1. I'm going to suggest at this point that we have a 30 minute break and reconvene round about as close to 20 past 1 as possible, please. And we will continue this application at that point. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Keep it on screen. Yeah. I'll keep it on screen. I don't want to risk it. She, the, the chairman had huge problems halfway through and was cut off. So I'm not fiddling with the computer there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Patricia, you, we could hear you speaking for what it's worth. Patricia, it appeared that you didn't mute yourself.
Hello, everybody. I hope we're all feeling refreshed. <clears throat> okay, it's one twenty. I think everybody is here. Do you see anybody, Philippa, that should be here that isn't? Please. Hello, Chairman. A few people have their cameras off, so I don't know whether they're behind the camera, but as far as I can see, everyone okay. is there. OK, well, we said 1.20, so let's resume with questions now from um, the applicant to um, Patricia Bramble, please. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any questions. Oh, you don't um, have I'm any. To, no, I'm going to address... Oh, that's right. You go, yes, you're... Made. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so where are we at? Sorry, I've just lost my flow for a minute. Uh, objections. Uh, Madam Chairman, but, uh, now it would be the opportune time for the supporters of the application to make their case. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Phillips. Yes, so could I please call um, uh, Philip Colvin, please, to speak first. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much indeed, um, councillors, and thank you for uh, allowing us to speak to you. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of the matters which have been dealt with in such detail by Mr Taylor. Uh, what I'm going to do is to address the question of balance which you have set out at page three of your agenda papers. So I'm going to address you first, and then I'm going to call three witnesses who will speak just for two minutes each, uh, whose evidence was uh, served a week ago uh, in accordance with your rules and with your permission. So as thank I said, thank you very much indeed. Um, Madam, Crystal Palace Park acquired its name 166 years ago and for more than half the time since then there's been no crystal palace there at all it burnt down 84 years ago this very week and since then successive bodies have struggled to deal with the dilapidated legacy of this world famous site First, there was the then trustees, then there was the London County Council, then was the, there was the Greater London Council, and now the London Borough of Bromley, all of whom have tried their level best to restore the park as a place of ecological, recreational and cultural delight. In many ways, today is the most important day for this park since that fire and there will be one more crucially important day shortly when your colleagues on the planning committee meet to determine the planning application for the re regeneration of the park these applications essentially go hand in hand for the planners 
will hopefully make a decision which deals at last with the capital deficits within the park. And today, you will hopefully make a decision which deals with the income deficits. And with those two streams of works work accomplished, we are on track to restore this park and give it a sustainable future. Now, please let me be clear. We on the Crystal Palace Park Trust are no pushovers. We are hard-nosed company directors. And we have driven a hard bargain with Live Nation for the privilege of running these events in your park. And so this is a hugely profitable event for Crystal Palace Park Trust. It will form the keystone of our income in years to come, if the license is granted. And it will enable us to recruit staff, dedicated staff, and to plan our business and our investment in the park in the years to come with confidence. And I want to make this pledge to you. Every penny which we raise in this park stays in this park. It is a principle which we hold dear and we guard jealously. And all the adults who use this park and their children and their children's children will benefit from the income arising from these events. And they will start to benefit from next year as we begin to flush investment into the park for the benefit of its one million plus annual visitors. Each year, we will build on the last as we take on projects to improve biodiversity, play, sport, interpretation, education and culture within this extraordinary place, including to take one example as early as next year, the beginning of a multi-year project or much loved concert platform, or as Mr Patel correctly called it, giving it its local name, the laptop for community use. And that is, as I say, a multi-year project which we want to start. And the objectors, if they are park users, and I hope they are, will benefit from the holding of these events, as indeed will the struggling local businesses from the footfall which these events generate and the reputational enhancement to the area which they will bring. The price of all this is two weekends of music to be enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people. And yes, there will be impact, but it will be impact strictly controlled as Mr Taylor uh, has so carefully delineated. And I want to say this to you, if anyone has a better idea about how to raise the cash to restore the faded glory of this crumbling park for the benefit of South Londoners and the nation, let them speak now. I have listened for nearly a quarter of a century since when I was very young, I first became involved in the travails of this park and I have heard none. The Crystal Palace Park Trust is not only an expert body in its own right, comprising a huge range of expertise, which we have described to you in our document, but is one constituted by the will of the London Borough of Bromley and is comprised following a public appointment process of members, no leaders, of the local community who have approached their fiduciary tasks with skill and dedication, always striving for that balance between the needs of the park and its users and the needs and sensitivities of the local community. Knowing, of course, that we cannot please all of the people all of the time, but we are part of that community and we are answerable to it. 
And as such, I hope you feel that the voice of the trust is one which is entitled to some weight. Now, the concept of these events has been long in the planning, and we have considered deeply and in consultation with the community what should go where in the park at what times of year according to what parameters and over what duration and with what levels of attendance and in doing so we have taken all requisite advice and as i said we've given this the closest consideration so as to respect both the park and the local community to maximize the benefit and to minimize so far as reasonably practicable the impact during the whole course of the year. And we have concluded that the best model is to have two large back to back events in the park rather than try to attain our income through constantly building and dismantling site infrastructure and fencing the terraces at different points during the summer and maybe even spring and autumn months with a large number of mid-sized events, which in fact our published events policy would permit. We have decided, just as the trustees of the Royal Parks decided to hold the British summertime events over a condensed period in Hyde Park to condense events in two back-to-back -back weekends. And I have to say to you, had it not been for COVID, and had the trust not been involved at all this year, there would have been two large festivals on this park at different times of year, each with their own build and de-rig periods. We are building that together, which minimizes impact. And as it happens, maximizes profit for our events partner and therefore enables us to negotiate the best return for the park for the benefit of this and future generations. This has been thought through extremely carefully. The question of the identity of the provider, the controls they implement, the commitment they show to the protection of the park and the community, the liaison which they are prepared to engage in before, during and after these events, and the legally enforceable conditions which they are willing to submit to is of cardinal importance to us. For we will not, we would not green light an operator whom we did not trust to get this right, because we are answerable to this park and to its users and to our local community, not just at election time, but every single day in every single interface which we have with our local stakeholders. We were not bound to accept Live Nation. They were by no means the only supplicant. We chose them and we trust them to get it right. And trust, councillors, is a wonderful thing. But trust, backed up by stringent contractual obligations, is better. And we've done that too. And we've wrapped Live Nation in conditions which we have negotiated over a period of months so that we ensure that all of the relevant protections occur independently on, of the license, but supplementary to it. And we ourselves will be monitoring these events using our own highly experienced consultant to ensure that the delivery of this event minimizes impacts and is done to an exemplary standard of professionalism and best practice and that all lessons are learned and carried forward not just year on year but day on day now we are heartened having made our choice that they have taken care to meet with community represent representatives and responsible authorities and transport providers uh, since we made our choice. We are encouraged that they have employed Jim Griffiths and his modesty would forbid, but let me say it to you, who is the doyen 
of the profession, universally respected by the industry and by public authorities, to be the acoustician for the event. We are impressed that they've already had structural engineers on site to ensure that those precious historic assets are preserved and that they will also be taking requisite measures in partnership with us pursuant to the contract to protect the park's biodiversity, flora and fauna. We are assured that they will be establishing residence liaison before and during the event. And amongst many other factors, all these are signs that we are dealing with a well-resourced, highly professional organisation, which means to be a long-term partner for our trust and for the park and for its surrounding community. And everything that they've done since we accepted them as our events partners four months ago has reaffirmed our judgment about them. And I feel able, more than able, to commend them to you as fit and proper to run these events on our precious terraces, on our sensitive park, while protecting the licensing objectives. Now, I've had uh, the opportunity to consider the detailed operating schedule, which was put in as part of this application. Uh, licensing, um, including licensing of festivals, is what I do for a living. And so I viewed that operating schedule with an inquiring, let us say, BDI. Uh, and I can say that the content of that operating schedule uh, are not just a list for the sake of having a list. It is a well-constructed and thorough suite of obligations enforceable by law, because everything there will be translated into conditions. It is amongst the most detailed operating schedule, uh, which in decades of doing this, I had ever seen. Uh, Live Nation is an organization which trades on its reputation here and internationally. And you may be assured that the way this goes, building from the operating schedule to the conditions, to the 21 document event management plan, which has to be signed off by uh, the safety advisor group, including all of your experts and the transport providers and the police and so on and so forth, will amount to a detailed Bible of good practice for the holding of the events. It will run from experience to several hundred pages of detailed regulation. And once that environment, uh, that uh, event management plan is approved, it is written in stone and it must be delivered. And that is how large festivals are planned and delivered in this country. And there is no more experienced provider than Live Nation. And so I imagine it was a, a turn of phrase from uh, Patsy uh, Bramble this morning. It's not a question of it'll be all right on the night. It's, it's about as far from that uh, as you could possibly get. It is an extremely carefully planned um, uh, and monitored event, which is conducted wholly in line uh, with the expectations of all of the relevant uh, authorities and stakeholders. Now, this is a large event, and it would be extremely surprising if there were not some opposition to something of this scale and scope. In fact, one individual did a very large leaflet drop and a social media campaign to generate opposition from all the communities from the five boroughs around the park. And we do track these things, and it's fair to say that he had something of a flea in his ear from his social media campaign as the community poured out to say that he had really got hold of the wrong end of the stick. But inevitably, some level of opposition has come forward, and of course, they are entitled to their views. But what are the views of the public protection agencies? It is more than striking that having read the extremely detailed operating schedule, there was no objection from the Metropolitan Police. Now, the Metropolitan Police, of course, not only know this park 
I know what has happened in relation to past events in this park, including festivals of significant size. They also know Live Nation from all over London. They know what they do. And so it was more than striking that having read the detailed operating schedule, there has been no objection whatsoever from the Metropolitan Police. And as your statutory guidance under Section 182 of the Licensing Act tells you, they uh, are the main source of your advice on crime and disorder, both on site and off. And theirs was not no response, it sat in someone's in tray. It was crucially no objection. And similarly, there was no objection from health and safety who advise you on public safety or uh, your child protection uh, colleagues. But perhaps just as importantly, once your environmental health department had seen Mr Griffith's noise report and spoken with him, they actually withdrew their objection altogether. And that is their professional expert assessment. And without wanting to stray into Mr Taylor's territory at all, I can tell you from my experience and looking at the numbers in Mr Griffith's report, 75 decibels is the number routinely adopted in London parks. And if you adopt a level lower than that for these events, the headline acts won't come, the headline acts won't come, the customers won't come, the events won't happen, and the contract will fall to pieces, and we will be back to 1936. So we do urge you, um, we do have to compete with other London parks, but authority after authority after authority has looked at this and judged 75 to be an acceptable level. Mr Patel um, this morning was concerned that you might get 75 in one place, but not another place. Uh, and just very brief, because I'm sure Mr Griffiths will speak to that. Mr Griffiths at his sound desk can see the level at every one of the noise monitoring stations. And if the level is nudging over uh, the uh, allowed level at any of those monitoring stations, at any of them, he has to pull the sound back. And he, luckily, he's got the most advanced sound systems in the world to enable him to do that. So I can say to Mr Patel, with great confidence, as somebody who works in this field of regulation, he will not, wherever he happens to live, be suffering noise uh, above uh, the usual regulated level for London parks, which have been found acceptable in inner London, in outer London and the suburbs and so on and so forth when these events happen. And I should also just say, just for the, just for reference, I mean, one of the objects said, send them to Brockwell Park. And uh, Patsy Brown will also reference Brockwell Park. I, I live a hop and a skip from Brockwell Park and events happen for a week or two a year. And we understand why they've got to happen. And you, you just live with it. You can hear an event. Uh, and that's about the long and short of it. So the upshot is that in relation to uh, these large events, the judgments of all of your professional advisors correlate with our own judgment. And I should say that there are five boroughs around this park and sound and people are no respecters of borough boundaries any more than birds are. But not one single officer or councillor uh, of any of them has objected to these events. And I have spoken to councillors from around the park. My trustees have spoken to councillors from around the park and Live Nation have done it as well. And you have no objection from any of your political colleagues or professional officers from any of the five boroughs. I just want to say one other thing about the license, which was this suggestion that you should grant on a sort of um, probationary basis for a year. And I just want to make a number of points about that. The first point uh, is the point which is made by Mr. Taylor. It is of extreme importance to licensing, uh, which is that the events this year and in every future year are controlled by the events management plan. So if, heaven forfend, 
something needs a little bit of tightening year on year, then it will be tightened through the event management plan. And if Live Nation do not succeed in convincing your regulatory colleagues that they have tightened or tweaked sufficiently, the event management plan will not be approved. And if the event management plan is not approved, the event will not proceed. So that is why local authorities around the country feel perfectly competent year licenses, whether they are in perpetuity, which often happens, or 15 years or five years, uh, three years is very, very much at the lower end of this spectrum. Secondly, should local residents, local councillors, professional officers, or anybody else be unhappy with how these events happened and not be willing to trust Live Nation uh, to get this right in a following year, they have the absolute right, without any permission, without incurring any legal cost, to bring a review of this license and to have the matter brought before you and have Live Nation answer to you for their alleged depredations. And that is the actual control which was contemplated by the Licensing Act itself. It was intended to be light touch regulation, but with a heavy touch review mechanism if things did not go according to plan. And Mr. Ben, who's no spring chicken at this, knows this. If he gets on the wrong side of local residents, he will be sitting in front of you again next autumn begging to keep his license. And he knows that when he's planning this year's event. The third point to make about this, because we are talking about benefits of the park, is that it's generally commercially unfeasible for operators to set off on the track of a one-year license because they have to enter into multi-year agreements with contractors. They have to enter into advance agreements with artists who are not always bookable on nine months' notice. You want to get a world-class artist, you don't do it next July, uh, you may need to do it for the July after. And so it's terribly important for their planning that they've given, they've given the security of a multi-year event. But let me say a word about our planning. Uh, if there is a one-year license, uh, it uh, holds Crystal Palace Park Trust below the waterline because we will not be able to hire staff well, we won't be able to enter into any multi-year investments. All we'll know is we've got certainty just for next year. It is extremely uh, difficult then even for us to obtain the charitable status which we need because we're not going to be able to show the long-term um, programme uh, for this park. So it is absolutely fundamental to us that this is not um, a one-year uh, uh, licence. Uh, but... Uh, the year-on-year -year condition, the year-on-year -year controls through the event management plan. Ah, oh, shit. I'm not sure what's happened there with Mr. Colvin. Um... Let's just give him a minute to reconnect. I think he was nearing the end of his presentation in any event. Um, I hope you're happy to do that. Let's just hold fire for a couple of minutes, please. Thank you.
Philippa, can I ask if there's any obvious reason it's not our end that Mr. Colvin is not able to connect? No, I'm getting a message oh, up he's saying back. that it's low bandwidth. Okay. Mr. Colvin, are you back with us? I am. Where did did I did I did I leave you temporarily? When did oh, I leave you? Wait, we, we, we haven't heard the last 20 minutes. Only joking. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would say that's a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> we really we only lost you in about the last 30 seconds. So okay, if you'd I, like to pick up from possibly the beginning of your last paragraph, yeah. please. Thank I you. really wanted to say, address the point about uh, the use of the remainder of the park. And I wanted to say that all the play areas of the park, uh, of course, are unaffected by this event. The playground, the dinosaurs, the boating lake, the cafe and so on, and the skate park. I wanted to say that one of the most beautiful landscape areas, which is the English landscape to the north of the park, is unaffected. And I wanted to say that we have taken great care in liaison with Festival Republic to ensure that the park can be circumnavigated during these events. That's very important to us. Uh, and uh, Live Nation have taken that on board. And all of this, of course, goes in the balance which you are going to draw. And let me conclude by saying this. You can't visit Crystal Palace Park without the palpable sensation that something extraordinary happened here. It was in its heyday one of the wonders of the earth and emblematic of Britain's standing in the world. And even since that time, the park has hosted so many world-class events, from leading musicians to the FA Cup final to motorsports and international athletics. It has historically been a place of gathering and celebration. And over the decades, all of this has slipped away. And so the prestige of the park on the London, let alone the international stage, has declined with it. And we see huge benefit, not just to the park, but to the area in restoring the reputation of this park as a place where wonderful things happen once again, and with it, the self-esteem and confidence of the local community. So councillors, I just finished by saying this is a red letter day for Crystal Palace Park. Our trust was constituted by your council as an expert body to take over this park and run it on commercial principles. And so I say on behalf of the trust, which strongly endorses this application and this applicant, please grant this application as asked. We have no plan B and nor does anyone else. And so with that, I just want very quickly to call uh, three witnesses, each of whom I've asked to speak for two minutes and then we'll finish and we'll stop. Uh, and can I just start maybe at random with Oliver Marshall from the Concert Platform Group, if he's still with us? I am, indeed. Uh, thanks, Philip, and good afternoon. Hello, Mr. Marshall. Everyone. Hello, Mr. Marshall. Off you go. Two minutes, starting now. Starting now. OK, well, since starting our group a couple of years ago um, as a friends group of the Crystal Palace Concert Bowl, um, at any community-facing events that we have run or been involved in, uh, the appetite to see well-managed and professionally run live music in the park is tangible amongst the vast majority of local residents that we've met and spoken to. Uh, I think they clearly appreciate, um, as Philip mentioned, that the history and precedent of cultural events and happenings in, in Crystal Palace is one that stretches back almost uninterrupted for more than 160 years. And we've seen that there's a real desire to continue that tradition and to recapture some of that spirit and really just to make more of the park. Um, so having met some of the team at Live Nation and heard their plans and seen all of the immense experience that they bring to bear, uh, we're really encouraged and excited um, that there is now this opportunity to provide world-class entertainment for all local residents on our doorsteps. Um, as well as to help put Crystal Palace back on the map, really, as a place of national significance. Um, so for all those reasons and others that we put in our written submission, uh, in principle, we do support this application. Thank you very much, Mr Marshall. And now I'm going to ask Graham Whitlock to speak, if he, if he would be willing. Sure, of course. Thank you. Of collective, and that's the character. I'll just give you 
quick bit of background since 2006 crystal palace festival has produced high quality events that bring the local community together and we represent a partnership of about 40 local arts community groups businesses and we engage over 20,000 people annually now the festival has been responsible for organizing events in crystal palace park which have attracted 30,000 visitors over the course of one day these were the in the park in 2017 and 2018 and they demonstrated that the park has the capacity to host large-scale and well-run events and we are confident that our experienced operator like Live Nation is well placed to run professional and safe events to a high standard for 45,000 people Sarah Green, and she's got about 25 years experience of major commercial events. She was responsible for launching Wonderland and British summertime concerts in Hyde Park. And collectively, we're satisfied that Live Nation are committed to ensuring that their events are going to have a positive And that is for young people to gain work experience experience to engaging neighboring residents and stakeholders some of whom have understandable concerns but engaging them in an ongoing consultation before during and after the events what's also philip has articulated already this license will absolutely benefit crystal palace park and it'll bring vital income into the trust which they can invest back into the park and the people enabling community events and activities and creating opportunities that will return the park to the heart of the community. And that's why the Great Northwood Collective supports this license application. Thank you. Graham, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr Whitlock. And finally, who do we have, Mr Colvin, finally, Ms. please? Chrissy Kinsella, who's the Chief Executive of the London Music Fund. Do go ahead, Ms Kinsella. Thank you. And thank you, Philip. And uh, I will be um, brief because I know we've all been here a very long time. Um, I'm the chief executive, as Philip said, of the London Music Fund, which is the mayor of London's music education charity. And we work with every London borough to offer musical opportunities for children and young people, particularly those from disadvantaged or challenging backgrounds. Um, I'm also a resident of SE20. I've lived here for 10 years. Um, I would like to talk a little bit just about the human impact of um, events like this in the park, because we've heard a lot about the logistics. I believe passionately in the power of music to build communities and to, to um, develop lives. The wider impact of this festival will have a huge impact on platforms and opportunities for young people in the area, for schools, for music hubs, for music education providers, community groups, youth clubs and young people and their families. As Philip said, the investment in the park will also be able to provide opportunities throughout the year. So not just on the weekends that the festival will be taking place, but the, the park and its opportunities and its programme of arts and education will be developed throughout the course of the year, not just the short time that the festival will be taking place. Um, the wider access to events like this in the park will offer increased opportunities for young people to access high quality professional music performances, as well as performing opportunities for young people, young artists and grassroots uh, projects. Some of the communities in the areas that we live in are going to be among the most adversely affected in the coming years as we recover from COVID-19. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the impact um, of opportunities like this for performance, for creativity, for community development, for recovery, um, and the investment that the Trust will be able to put back into the park will provide a um, huge uh, opportunity for embedded recovery um, for the partners that it works with in the local area. And I think we have the opportunity to put Crystal Palace on the map as a real hub for cultural, musical, educational and arts uh, provision. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Mr. Colvin, that's all your supporters. Thank you very much for all of your contributions. Um, I'm now going to go back to Mr. Taylor, um, but I'm only going to allow questions from either myself, Councillor Evans or Councillor Allen before we hear the final submission. 
So, uh, Councillor Evans, do you have any final questions for Mr Taylor, please? I haven't, Madam Chairman, no. And Councillor Allen? Oh, no, thank you, Madam Chairman. OK, thank you. Um, I've, I, I have no further questions either, but I just would like to respond to two points that um, Patricia Bramble made. And the first is that we do consult when we have applications of this size where there are cross-border concerns to both the local authority and local councillors. And the only um, authority to respond was Southwark and they had no objections. And I assume that the other four, I think you said five neighbouring boroughs, the other four had no objections either. And this is actually for future reference, perhaps I think to Steve Phillips, I wonder, or a question really, um, in respect of um, objectors not receiving relevant paperwork, um, is it normally, are they normally available on request, please, Mr. Phillips? I would just like to know that for future hearings, please. Madam Chair, the, we hope for all hearings that all paperwork is submitted and in place when the report is pushed forward to yourselves. And unfortunately, uh, with large events like this, literally Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of last week, I was dealing with paperwork being submitted by Mr Colvin's team and the applicant's team and indeed the public health news nuisance team. It, it's impossible to then put a pack together. We simply don't have the time frame to get it out to objectors. And actually, the objections must stand on the application as it is made. Um, although it sounds very unfair for the the uh, the objectors not to get another bite of the cherry, if you like, all of the additional information should hopefully have put at bay some of their worries rather than raised their concern. But, I mean, that's just my my opinion. Um, so we don't, unfortunately, have the ability to constantly update everyone as things progress because we, we're, we're simply not set up to, to manage it that way. OK, thank you, Mr Phillips, for that clarification. And I would just add to the objectors that... Certainly in this case, I believe that Mr Taylor, as we have all said, gave a, a most comprehensive um, presentation. And I think pretty much all queries that have come up throughout this hearing were answered within that. So you've heard, I just wanted to address that issue that you raised, um, Ms Bramble. Thank you very much for that. Okay, go on, Ms Bramble. You're on mute. Try again. What? Third time lucky. Just to say, I w did the um, supporters of this uh, application get all the paperwork that the applicant had put in, the new applicant? Because what I can't understand is why the new paperwork was not just available on site. I don't expect it to be hand delivered to my house, but I do expect it to be made available via the web so that it's freely uh, available for reference purposes. I don't expect to put in a second objection, but I would like to be able to, to hear the points which the applicant was trying to make and did make very forcibly, but I couldn't follow it. That's all. I see. Thank you. Uh, Mr Phillips, have you any comeback on that? It's not available online either, I take it. Um, Madam Chairman, we simply can't react to that quickly, unfortunately. Um, okay. Thank you. Well, we'll leave it at there, Ms Bramble, and I, I think we've gone as far as we can with that. I just wanted to address your point as, as fairly as I was able. And on that note, there are no more questions. So myself, Councillor Evans and Councillor Allen will now retire to consider this. Uh, Mr. Councillor, Councillor Evans? You're on mute. We hear submissions. Uh, oh, I'm very sorry. We hear submissions. Thank you, of course. Yes. So finally, back to Mr. Taylor. And may I just ask Mr. Taylor, 
um, given that we have all been here a considerable time and your presentation, comprehensive, was also lengthy, I hope you can make the submissions brief, please. Thank you. Um, and what I promised I would do is I promised I would respond um, to some of the points made, and I think it's only it's only respectful for me to respond to some of the points made by the two objectors. Um, first of all, could I uh, could I say that we we genuinely appreciate the concerns and the issues that are raised because it does reinforce. Um, the planning exercise that we go through. Um, that isn't idle, um, idle appreciation. Um, as I pointed out in my original submission, we are going to continue that engagement and we have already penciled three other meetings uh, with residents um, as our plans develop. That leads me to the second point. Um, and with respect to the objectors, um, I, I think they're approaching, uh, approaching, <laughs> they're approaching the event um, from the wrong perspective. They should be approaching from the perspective of the process that we are putting in place to deliver this event. And that is a very, very strong process, which is managed by, first of all, by conditions, and secondly, um, by monthly meetings uh, with SAG. There is a planning process, and that planning process has barely started. At this moment in time, it struck me, um, listening to Ms Bramble's objections, that there was an attempt to micromanage the event before the plan has been fully developed uh, for the event. And I, and I just think that is the wrong approach. Um, you, you, I believe, have to look at the evidence and have to look at the process and decide whether that process is, is robust enough to, develop, to uh, allow us to produce a satisfactory event. Moving on now, just quickly to some points. Right. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting some... Uh, the reason I'm hesitating <coughs> is uh, there's another microphone which is... Uh, which is playing. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll continue. Right, as far as, as, far as um, suggesting that um, there are too many events, look at other parks. Finsbury Park have six events, Victoria Park 10, Clapham Common 10, Hyde Park 6. Um, there is nothing out of the ordinary in us asking for um, six events. Um, in terms of, th thank you, Chair, for clarifying <laughs> um, what's been done with the other authorities. We've been in touch with the other uh, neighbouring local authorities too. And we also know that uh, with regard to noise, for example, um, your authority, the other authorities are being consulted on that. There was reference to the types of music that we might play. That isn't the issue under the Licensing Act. The Licensing Act is about levels and levels not causing nuisance, not the particular types of music. Obviously, everybody has preferences for different types of music. There was, there was a comment made that we're gonna have 11 and a half hours of music um, and entertainment every day. That's not correct. Um, in our planning, for example, um, on a Friday, we are not going to start um, during school times. Um, our events will only begin after school um, has uh, has finished. There was reference to CCTV off-site. Yes, that is within our plans. Uh, but of course, there is CCTV, which is already controlled by others off-site. So again, that has to be done through the SAG process. There's reference to traffic um, being choked, the public being in gridlock. Um, that's without even seeing a finalised plan. Well, th that's that simply is not right. If we don't deliver the plan to prevent group lock, the event won't go ahead. Um, we've already given a commit. We've already given a commitment um, to um, antisocial behaviour and how we'll deal with that. And, and I repeat what I said earlier. That is above and beyond 
what is our statutory duty. There's reference to coaches not being um, considered. Completely wrong. Um, there will be a few coaches. Uh, we will limit the number of coaches uh, that come to site and we will have a location for coaches to be parked. Drug dealing, um, again, it is covered in, in, in our planning. There is going to be a drug policy agreed with the police. Um, and if I may say so, um, all of these points are addressed. When it comes to capacity, um, the, the capacity was put to you that it should be reduced. And the words we used say 35,000. Could I ask, where is the science in, say, 35,000? Why not 36? Why not 40? Um, please, we have put forward a capacity which is based on science, which is based on the safe capacity for the site and the infrastructure around the site, and we will prove it through the planning process. Again, why are the hours to be cut back? The hours that we've proposed are what I would call normal conventional hours. Um, these points are important. It's not, it's not a matter of me being churlish. They're, they go to the very viability of the event. Um, and that's why I'm mentioning them now. Um, again, in terms of train capacities, we have spent months engaging already with train companies about capacities. We are aware of what the capacities are and we are aware of what the cap capacities can be and we are now in the final stages of putting a plan together which is going to be put before SAG when it is convened. Turning now to Mr Patel, he made um, uh, similar remarks uh, to Miss Bramble. I'm not going to repeat those but I am going to deal with the issue of noise and, and that is a very very simple point that the <clears throat> There is a maximum noise level at all of the noise measure, measuring uh, positions. If it is exceeded at any of them, then attention must be paid to that and they must be reduced. Otherwise, there will be a breach of the license. And I'd also point to you again that we have four of Vanguardia's acousticians who will be monitoring off-site noise and responding to noise complaints throughout the events. Um, those, those are the comments that I wanted to make. I'm not going to address you and remind you about any of the evidence. Um, all I am going to ask you to do, please, is to grant the license with the conditions that have been put to you in writing and also subject to the two amendments that I asked to be made with regard to uh, litter and waste. And I'd ask you to grant the license on that basis. And thank you very much for your careful attention throughout today. Thank you so much for that. And it's now time for us to retire to consider this application. Councillor Evans, you're shaking your head again. Don't the You're objectors on. have a last submission, Madam Chairman? No, no, they don't. No, they don't. Thank you. So we will um, be back when we've um, concluded um, the thoughts that we have on this application. Thank you so much.
Hello, can everybody hear me? We, we can, Jay, okay. yes, thank you. Okay, Philippa, are you back with us? Yes, you are. Hello. Hi. Okay, so we're all here. Where's Councillor Allen gone? There she is. Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, first of all, can I thank everybody for their patience this afternoon, this morning and this afternoon, in what's been actually for me a, a, a most interesting um, hearing. And the decision is as follows. This panel has made the following decision having regard to the four licensing objectives, the council statement of licensing policy 2016 included to 2021. Guidance issued under the Licensing Act 2003, written and oral representations from the applicant, written and oral representations from local residents, and written and oral representation from Mr Colvin and witnesses in support. The decision of the subcommittee is to grant the licence as applied for, with the conditions and amendments as stated. The decision of the licensing committee is subject to an appeal process by any party. Full details of this process will be supplied in the full decision letter, which will be released within the five, next five working days. As this will be the first event of such kind in the borough, it will be subject to extreme scrutiny to ensure that it complies with all of its stated conditions and the advice given by Safety Advisory Group to ensure that it goes ahead in a safe and secure manner and has the minimum disruptive impact so far as it is reasonably practical on the residents of the borough. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.